Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about the results from the European International Championships, the decks that did well, why a certain someone played a certain deck, and all that and more. Everything EUIC and also the announcements from EUIC. We'll talk about that as well. We will go over some brand new cards that have released in the past week. There are some pretty interesting ones that we're definitely going to have to be taking a look at. Uh, we will, of course, have everyone's favorite segment of the podcast, Guess That Flavor Text. And then we're going to wrap it up by talking about Orlando Regionals this weekend, which is set to be a massive tournament. Back-to-back -back weekends of absolutely insanely large events. And then we are going to wrap things up over on our Patreon with our weekly exclusive bonus episode. If you want to see more from myself and Azul, the best place to do it is over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash uncommon energy podcast my name is chip richie joined here as always in a different place than normal but well i guess it's the same place for me yeah it's a different place for you, <laughs> different, for you. It's a different angle for me uh, my name is chip richie joined here as always by azul gg and yes for our audio listeners who may be confused what we mean we're actually recording in person azul came with me after euic and is staying here for a couple days until orlando regionals this weekend Azul, what's up, buddy? How we doing? Doing pretty good, Chip. Just got back from London. Um, always a good time in London. I mean, the venue is always really, really good. And it was really good this time as well. Lots of space. Um, so, yeah. Wasn't too crowded or anything. So, yeah, I had a good time in London uh, at the tournament. Long flight back. But my flight there and actually and back weren't too bad. I slept, like, the majority of the way. Also, because I came back to the East Coast this time. It was only, like, mm. seven and a half hours. I think it's, like, ten hours from the West Coast. Yeah. So, but well, it's a flights. five hour difference from here to London. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the flight time. Oh, I was talking yeah, about the flight yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see, I flight see, time, I see. flight time. So, yeah. But I like slept most of the ways there and back. So, pretty easy coming and going. I guess one thing we should have mentioned there's also Perth Regionals this weekend as well. Yes, in, in addition Australia. to Orlando. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, not going to be quite as big, uh, but is going to be a little bit of a, not as much, a little bit of an international competition. I know there's some American players going. And some Japanese players, I assume, yeah, probably. Be some, like Haru and stuff might make their way over over there. I think they popped up. Haru's, Haru's been there a couple times now this year already. Perth is on the opposite end of the continent, so it's probably not as convenient to get to as like Sydney and Australia, but... It's just like a layover then, right? Yeah, you come in... Potentially. I don't know the, the details of their planned travel or anything. What but... it would look like. Yeah, Australia's not that big, so as long as, I, as, long as you get to the island or whatever. Australia's pretty big, buddy. Well, I mean, in comparison... Do you know how big it is compared am I, am to I America? You are massively right. trolling. Okay, Australia is huge. Go. Australia size compared to U.S. About to get. You're about to get cooked. The USA is about 1.28 times larger than Australia. Oh, so it's not that much. Wait. So it's not that yeah, big of a difference. Okay, yeah. Like, there's only like. Yeah, here you go. Look at this picture. <laughs> oh yeah, this big. <laughs> Dude, I Australia was small, bro. Could just because it's an island. Oh man! I mean, it's not even. It's not even. You know, you know, no one calls it an island, right? I was gonna troll you with that as well. No one calls it an island. Mm. I mean, it is an island. I guess. I mean, at some point, you know, all that's what I'm saying. Bodies of land are technically islands, right? But yes, uh, EUIC for me was cool. Um, I had a really hard time with the jet lag, to be honest, and I don't really know why. I normally don't do terrible. I normally don't do like amazing with jet lag, but like I got there the first day. I slept a little bit on the flight. I landed Wednesday morning. I was pretty tired. I made it until like 8.30 and then crashed. Uh, and then I woke up at 3 a.m. and could not go back to sleep. And then that same thing happened the next night. Woke up at 3 a.m. Couldn't go back to sleep. And then, yeah, I just got, I was very tired the whole time, but hopefully we'll be back to normal here. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty successful outing for both of us. I had a good time doing the like hosting and interviews and segments on the floor. All that stuff was pretty fun. And you had a pretty good tournament run as well as all. Yeah, I ended up top 16. I was in contention for top eight for a little while. Um, I think I fell apart round three or four. Of day two. Yeah, 13. I lost uh, Hector Ibarra um, uh, playing Chien Pao. So that's, that's the point where I was no longer in contention for top eight. And then... You know, Which is pretty crazy there. to say because you were only like X22, right? And it was like you just knew you couldn't yeah, make yeah, top yeah. cut anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ended up 
with 35 match points, I actually beat Aiden on the win it in, and Aiden was in contention for Top Cup for a couple rounds, and uh, was on a win it in, going into the last round. I was actually talking to Aiden going into the last round. I was like, yeah, you probably got to play it. Good luck. And then I was like, oh, I'm paired against you. <laughs> and then I beat Aiden Tough, buddy. on his win it in. Uh, for me, it was just another round to try and get Top 16. So that was kind of unfortunate. I was kind of rooting for Aiden to to pull through as of like talking to you know what with with what players were at the top tables. Yeah. Um, Another the, American in cut wouldn't have been yeah, so bad. Yeah, yeah. For sure, but I'm not gonna pass up on the opportunity to like play for top sixteen as well. So as you shouldn't. Yeah. So, but yeah, for actually mentioning the jet lag, jet lag, I guess it was pretty bad for me. Like I just naturally woke up at five every single day and. I just stayed up. I was like, well, here we are. I'm up, yeah. I just, like, was like, I'm not even going to try. Just, like, make... The, like, 5 a.m. is not that bad, because I'd have to get up... It's not, yeah. ...at, like, 7 anyway, so if I can just go to bed earlier on the following day, um, or days after that. Did morning. you start to feel that, though, at the end of each of those days? Like, extra... A little more extra tired than you would have normally been, you think? I mean, not really. Just, like, traveling and playing in terms in general is already tired. It didn't feel that much worse than other tournaments. And it, obviously, it got, ran pretty smoothly as well, if I remember correctly. I think got out of there around, like, 9 ish i don't really remember for sure to be honest um but then going into day two i actually is when it like i my time had adjusted and then i didn't wake up i woke up at my alarm at seven which i almost didn't set the night before and honestly it could have got kind of bad because i don't think anyone else set an alarm either uh -huh. well oh what? no i think i think some, someone else was up when i was up i think um yeah someone else was up when i was up but i had to like wake up grant before yeah i'm not surprised um, there yeah so someone else was up before i was up then I, I woke up at 7, so that's when I had to actually just start to adjust to the time time frame. But yeah, it wasn't too bad overall. Not as bad as it's been in the past, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I ended up getting top 16 with uh, the lost Tina, um, which we ended up on just because, I don't know, we really couldn't find anything else. We cooked some stuff up, um, everything out, and it just kind of felt like overall the most powerful deck with a slightly positive Charizard matchup. You can kind of beat everything. And the deck's like fairly like... Especially in comparison to Lugia or Chin Pao. Like I feel like Tina's like... Maybe more consistent isn't the correct term. But it has way more coming than either of those decks. Right? So we kind of liked it for that reason. Like yeah, sometimes it does feel like you are put in situations where you have to... Uh, abyss Seeking when you don't want to. Kind of off-tempo Abyss Seeking. But... Because of the rock sands and stuff, and like the different things you can do with it, I give a ton of comeback potential, which I uh, utilized multiple times throughout the uh, throughout the tournament. I actually had a big one against Aiden in the last round. Like I was sitting there abyss seeking, couldn't find Colrus. He drew three prize cards before I even attacked, and then it was just like bring up your Pidgeot, rock sand, or it was like rock sand counter catcher, loss impact your Pidgeot, and then kind of made the comeback from there. So yeah, yeah. I got a ton of comeback potential, like, specifically in the Charizard matchup. Yeah, it definitely For seems sure. like a good selling point. Uh, I mean, in the last format, Tina versus Charizard felt like a pretty 50-50 matchup. And yeah. that was when you had passed the peak as Giratina. Yep. And you, like, really never played Tina in the last format. You were nope. pretty famously uh, a hater of Lost Tina in the last <laughs> format. Uh, so I think a lot of people were pretty surprised to see that that was the deck that you chose to play for the event. Um now, I guess you did just kind of talk through, like, the big differences, or, like, I guess why the... Uh, you talked about the main reasons of what the deck can do as to why you chose to play it, but maybe what are some of the uh, changes from, like, the rotation standpoint, like, old cards that left that deck, and then other decks in general, and then uh, new cards in the format that made Tina more powerful? Yeah, so you did lose Path to the Peak, but you also lost, like, a couple bad matchups, like Maridon and Roaring Moon were mm -hmm. favorable, right? Uh, Path to the Peak, you definitely played if you could. You just can't. Um, <laughs> can't play that anymore. But yeah, you lost a couple bad matchups. And then your Charizard matchup is... Like last one, I feel like it was like 50-50. I think you're actually favoring this one. But it's all because of the Verzian. Having two ways to one-hit KO Charizard. The can... Iron Leaves. Yeah, yeah. The Iron Leaves. The um, Future Verzian. The Future Verzian. Is that what I just called it? <laughs> yeah, you called it Verzian, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Iron Leaves having two ways to one-hit KO Charizard is like a really, really big deal. Um, and Prime Catcher is insanely powerful in the deck. It's like absurd how good that card is in the deck. Yeah, it's and really good in, in loss of yeah, loss of decks in general is what I was gonna say. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, I think you're now like solidly favored against Charizard. Like not like a buy a lot. Maybe it's like a sixty-five or a fifty-five, forty-five. But last format, I feel like it was like maybe you're advantaged by like two percent or something. 
So it feels better now for that reason. But yeah, you lost Path, but you gained the Iron Leaves. Uh, also, we included Spirit Tomb, which is a huge deal. Like, half of my Charizard games were, like, win game one, going back and forth, and then game two, turn one Spirit Tomb, and then they can't Ultra Ball for Lumini, and then they're lost. Like, literally half of my... I, I think I went 10-0 against Charizard or something total. And yeah. Besides the Aiden match, every every other Charizard I played against, I played against, like, five Charizards. One of the games was just turn one Spirit Tomb, and then they can't Rotom or they can't Luminion. Um, and one or maybe two of them I opened the Spirit Tomb when they went first like they were like they saw a game once and like okay I'll go first into game two and then I opened the Spirit Tomb on them and then uh, they can't use that turn one can't use that turn one and it just falls apart so that was like another big deal we added the Spirit Tomb good for the control matchup good for the Charizard matchup uh, the Cleffa technology is out there now so a little bit say. less good going forward but yeah and but still a really good deck I think actually uh, Tina is probably the most it's gonna come up in popular. It's like the most under was like the most underappreciated deck going to EUIC, I feel like. Or the not the underrated. That or Gardevoir, underrated. I would say, probably fits yeah, that bill yeah. for sure. I could even see like the when some of the ancient box stuff being in there. But we'll talk more about those yeah. things as we break into the results from EUIC. Um and speaking of which, yeah, let's just get into it. So EUIC was the largest tournament of all time outside of Japan. Yeah. 2,605 players. A behemoth of a tournament. Um, London as a location was cool. I had never been to London for a Pokemon tournament. I went once before after EUIC when it was in Frankfurt. Had a good time like vacationing and doing some touristy stuff. I'm glad I have done that before because I didn't do any touristy stuff this time. I didn't leave the Excel Center area like at all <laughs> um, yeah. once I got there. Um, but London is a very cool city. Um, the Excel Center, it didn't feel like there was a lot to do around there. I know that's something you've talked about in the past. And I feel like for a lot of people uh, that have been going to EUIC for years, they wouldn't mind seeing EUIC be somewhere else. It's yeah. been in Berlin in the past. It was meant to be in Berlin in 2020 when it got canceled. And then it was in Frankfurt in 2022. And I think everyone enjoyed that. But I don't know space-wise, really, if there's another option besides the Excel Center. I mean, surely somewhere in Europe, I guess, but... Yeah, there's got to be, like, another... But, like, there's got to be, like, another venue that could hold the amount of players, for sure. But I guess it's, like, the convenience. Like, one that has to be... Is super convenient, I think, for everyone outside of Europe. And I have to imagine it's one of the most convenient places in Europe for mm -hmm. people to get to by train or flight or whatever, so... Yeah. Yeah, I've, um... anyone I talked to... Asked him how their travel was. Like, I talked to Robin Schultz. I talked to Alessandro. Asked him, like, yeah, how was the travel there? And it's like, I mean, it's, you know, a couple-hour flight. You know, it's just not bad yeah. at all getting anywhere. Um, so it seems like for everyone in Europe, it's really convenient for everyone. Like, I, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have to move. Maybe it just stays there for forever. Like, yeah. I feel like that's not, like, a bad But I do think people are really thing. excited for NAIC, right? That it's in a new place, you know? That like, is true I, as well. That is fair. That is fair. I'm sure a lot of the Europeans wouldn't mind it being somewhere else, because it's probably still... Like, traveling in Europe seems like it's just reasonably convenient, no matter where you go for yeah. the most part. And especially anywhere they would actually put it, so... How did it feel like, from a player's perspective, that the uh, the tournament was run, overall? Um, I mean, it's a little bit slower than some of the regionals we've had recently. But it wasn't, um, like... Was it, like, overly... I think it wasn't like overly Slug slow. Yeah, because like I said, I think we got out of there at nine ish, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's definitely right because the stream was finishing up around nine and they yeah. were like trying to get the stream finished up around that time. So, yeah, so I want to say we're we we're done around nine ish, which is like fine. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, could have been ran better, but uh, I'm sure that's something they're striving for, for sure. So, but it was it was like fine. It was fine overall no like major complaints not that i can think of i'm trying to remember back but i can't like think of anything the tables were actually lined up like uh like that's like the one thing from last year that was, the tables were just lined up so weird last time the i feel like i were, remember like, you guys talking yeah like, it was like some kind of that, zigzag yeah. format so it's like you it wasn't like continuous where you'd be like oh uh, i'm at table 500 here's table 256 and now I know where to walk towards to get to table 500. Last year, it was in a way where it was like, oh, I should be walking this direction. And you're like, that's table one. Where, why is that there? Where should I go? It would be like table one through 50. And then in like going this way, table one through 50. And then a normal format would be like 51 down like this all the way to 100, right? But what they did last year, I think, was like table one to 50, 
from here to here, and then on this end, it was table 50. Something one like that, to 100, yeah. right? Is it something like that where it's like you get to 50 and you're it like, oh, confusing. I'm meant to be at 51, but I'm meant to be all the way over yeah. here. It was yeah. definitely confusing the way they had it last year, but this year was like normal table setup. So I don't know what the difference they made was, but they did correct that mistake from last year. Yeah, cool. Overall, well ran event. It was pretty sick. I was expecting to see the, because you weren't at London World, so you didn't see it. I was expecting we were going to see there was like a kind of like a stage on a Torium type kind of setup for the main stage. I remember seeing that. Yeah, uh, like thought, on the Twitch streams and stuff. Yeah, I kind of just assumed that we were going to be in that area, but they didn't have that area this time, which was kind of unfortunate because it was like a really cool setup. It was like a stadium seating, kind of like stadium seating. Yeah, yeah. It would like go like there was like the normal venue floor, and then it would kind of dip down. Like on the far left of the venue, it would dip down. There'd be a bunch of seats, like stadium, like a stadium, and at the bottom there was the stage, the main stage cool, for everything. Yeah. So I was like, I was hoping that they would have that this year, but they didn't have that this year. They had that world so but if we come back to London and we're that much bigger, maybe they bring it, bring it back. Well, let's talk about the meta for the tournament as far as gameplay and decks are concerned. Uh, and Charizard was the most popular deck. Don't think that's really a surprise to anyone. I think yeah. everyone should have known that Charizard was going to be the most popular deck. I will say, like, being 23%, 22.85% is probably a little higher than I would have thought. I would have... Not been too surprised to see it like pushing 20, 18 to 19 would have been more yeah, realistic. But I mean, even then, like I probably wouldn't have thought it was like I would have been maybe a little surprised, but not too surprised by that. 23% is a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. But when you kind of think about it, I don't think it really is that surprising. It's the only deck in the format that's like, oh, this is the top deck. No one is like, oh, this is the top deck. And this is also a top deck. Like last format, it was like Gardetina. Zard, yeah, so, like and Moon, Moon, Moon sometimes, or I don't both yeah. of their appearances throughout the meta as well. Where it's like, oh, well, I don't think anyone ever considered Moon a top deck, but it did just get played a lot. But like the people, like the decks that were considered the top decks throughout the whole for or throughout the whole format, uh, meta to meta was, you know, Zard, Guardi, Tina, and it was like, okay, when all these are three are towards the top, and like Guardi usually wasn't at the top three because it was just you know a harder deck to play, kind of brings down its popularity, whatever. Um, but there was like, you know, a two to three top deck situation going on. But you come to this format, it's like, oh, it's it's Charizard, right? And everything else exists. And I think that is true for the most part. And um, it's just a, that step above everything else. Yeah. So I But it's different it be... from like the Lugia format, right? Where it was such a step above everything else, right? Yeah. I think, I mean, the Zard deck definitely has its flaws and bad matchups, right? And we saw people going leading up to the tournament and going into the tournament tech for it in different ways you had the zards playing most player most of the top players playing some like pseudo control zard type deck um and uh having like the eerie in there a lot of people had eerie in there for the chi and pow matchup uh, more so than anything so people like were picking their techs and like figuring out what is the most relevant decks to beat and it seems like charge can handle most things if not everything it's kind of what you want to tech for on the day more so than anything so so yeah, I think it's just going into the tournament. It doesn't surprise me, honestly. I feel like my prediction should have been adjusted a little bit. I should have predicted it to be a little bit higher. I think my final number I put out there for the deck was like 17. But I should have at least been predicting 20% for Charizard because it is the only... It is above everything. Yeah, it, it is, is above everything step else. above like everything else. Yeah, solidly a step above everything else in terms of power level, I think, overall. Or at least perceived power level. Sure. Uh, like, the whole community perceives it to be the more most powerful deck in the format by far. Um, so it being this popular isn't that big of a surprise to me. Honestly. I think, you know... Looking at it myself, looking back, I was like, eh, I probably should have predicted this a little bit better. Jim Powell was the second most popular deck. Also not too big of a surprise. 12% yeah. is still really high. Uh, Lugia not too far behind at 9%. I guess it's like a decent little step down there. Um, neither of those two is like that big of a surprise to me. A bit of a surprise, though, is that Arctina was so high. Almost 8%. 7.98% of players in day one playing Arceus Giratina V-Star. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a surprise. Oh, it's a little bit, yeah. Honestly, it is a little bit of a surprise. In terms of, I think the deck sucks, so I don't know why it's up there that high. Um, I was really hype on the deck going into the format, actually, but then you actually get some games in, you figure out what's actually good, what's bad. It's yeah. like, wait a second, this deck's not that good. Uh, but you look what's past it, and it's like, okay, how, how much better are any of these decks than Arctina? Or for like where we are in the meta, sure. it doesn't seem like that ridiculous that Arctina was actually there. Because you look at the Iron Hands deck, and you're like, I mean, if you're going to go up against Charizard, do you want to be playing Arctina or Hands? It's like probably Arctina. Sure. You look at Lost Tina, and Lost Tina I think is the most underrated deck in the format right now, or at least going to EYC it was, and I think that'll probably change moving forward. I think people understand Lost Tina's power again, and it will be, uh, should be in probably the top three, like moving forward for sure. 
because nothing really it's kind of a quick Boston. turnaround for it to have that big of a jump i think but you look at laic That's we went true. from laic everyone thought Morada was dead unplayable deck wins the event literally the next week and there was a tournament in europe 15 percent of the meta so true i think in these first and i like thought about this and kind of analyzed it and like okay how does this track moving forward and it's like, because like usually we, when we talk about this stuff, I feel like we both kind of agree that it's like, okay, if there's back-to-back -back weekends of a major tournament, the, the previous tournament's meta won't influence the next weekend's that much. It'll be like the weekend after that or two yeah, weekends after that. Yeah. Where it it really, needs a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, but I think in these early metas where people are kind of up in the air on what they want to play. That is, that's a good point. And yeah. they're like, I'm going to wait and see what happens at EUIC. I, I played with a couple decks. I'm going to pick based on EUIC. I think that's how people probably perceive the meta a little bit more in these sure. early early metas in formats. And I think, too, a lot of people are maybe just a little unsure about where to go with lists. Yeah. And so that's a big part as well, is that people are just waiting for there to be a good list to not necessarily copy, but, like, at least base their starting point on, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, sure. And, like, Charizard definitely had that because of all the success it had in Japan, right? And yeah. Pao had that because of the success it was having in Japan, but also the success it was having in the last format, right? Like, for these decks, Charizard and Pao, like, not a lot really had to change between last format and this one. And Tina, maybe not that much had to change, really. I mean, you lost VIP Pass and Path, but that frees up a lot of space. So you have a lot more options. Yeah. How many Poffin do you play? I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I guess it makes sense. Um, Which is like a weird but thing. But now that people, there's Bradner's list out there. He got second. There's your guys' list, you know, with you and Caleb both having really strong finishes. Like, I think there's a lot more, uh, like, people will definitely lean into that a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. I think Tina's going to have a huge resurgence in popularity compared to where it was last format. Chimpa is such a weird deck because the deck did get, did get stronger. It's kind of weird. Like, Tina got weaker. Yeah. I guess that Tina getting weaker is like... Lost Tina getting weaker is kind of like... I mean, there's... A, a, a lot of these decks do get hurt by Path, though, right? Like, <laughs> but Tina wishes it had Path, for sure. So Tina did get weaker as a deck and Chimpa did get stronger. But it's really interesting to look at it because, like, last format... Um, Everyone was kind of fine with Tina, thought it was a fine deck, but we saw like a pretty, this is like a pretty big drop off because it was like a 12% deck. Right. Down to six now. You look at Chi and Pao, it went for, it was, it was like a 2% deck at some point. Yeah. People hated the deck and people loved hating on the deck. <laughs> um, and I think the deck was always pretty solid throughout. It took, you know, Owen winning to kind of revive. Yeah, for sure. And like uh, give people hope or like give, you know, give people a reason to retry the deck. And now all of a sudden we see going into this tournament, like imagine if Owen didn't win, would Chi and Pao be this popular? Maybe not. I mean, yeah, because it's not like it was dominating over in Japan. I mean, a lot of people were basing yeah. their... It didn't do... It, it did nothing at the Champions League. It got, like, zero top 16s. Yeah, League. yeah. But it, it's been winning some of the City Leagues, right? Like, yeah, there's yeah, lists out there. People are using... I mean, lists. everything's been winning the City League, so... That's true. That's <laughs> Pothra. That's Pothra. Hey, Braden was on. Braden Elfert. He lost to Charizard on stream. I don't think that deck has a good Charizard match. I'm not going to... Well, it was funny. Net, so I you... ran into him during Sunday. Uh -huh. And uh, he was actually playing games with someone, playing his Espathra deck. I was like, oh, already testing for Orlando, huh? And he, he was like, oh, I'm actually not going to Orlando. And then he like, uh, was like, man, why'd y'all have to put me on stream? The one round I lost to Charizard, I went 6-1-1 one, and one <laughs> against Charizards. The one round I lost, I was on stream. And I was like, yeah, man, sorry, that's how it goes. And he went, I did kind of throw, though. Oh, <laughs> did he? Did he have a bet? I didn't watch that game, so I don't know for sure. And I was, But I heard one of the casters say, like, yeah, he just wasn't, he didn't go out of his way to get another fiddle down after oh you yeah. need the or the fiddle or the, the fiddle the fiddle whatever it was yeah when they're on the bench yeah the um, little guy yeah but it's like the chain bow thing is really interesting because it's like yeah it didn't do overly well in champions league um you know it did fine in city leagues but everything does fine in city leagues the deck definitely got stronger and maybe it was just kind of people um, it probably uses prime catcher the best of any deck maybe yeah. besides the lost zone decks yeah definitely yeah but then it's like yeah it's just really interesting because it's like if, if i wouldn't didn't win last format would this deck even be this popular right now or would it be like a five percent yeah that's a good question because it's like okay that like re uh reassure people that the deck can be good can be powerful and we saw it get a huge resurgence after oh and one with it and did that kind of just like lead into this format hype with the prime catcher yeah you get the the the, the code breaker or or do you think it would have been this popular because i think moving forward it'll probably drop off a little bit because of its poor performance but yeah it, so it's kind of interesting because at euic i mean we'll get more into the results in a minute but yeah. Uh, there were none in top eight. There was actually none in top eight of any of the three age divisions. No Chien Pao in top eight of junior, seniors, or masters. But there were two Chien Pao's that lost their win and ends to top eight in masters. Like, so it was right there, right? Like, it still had a solid showing. And if both of those players win, right, then there's two Chien Pao in top eight 
then we talk about it being one of the best converting decks into top cut you know it'll probably like continue its hype yeah it, it's forward as well i mean it probably does drop off like a bit but i still expect it to be a top three deck in orlando this weekend i would say i think yeah, I, guess, I think lugia's drop off might be a little higher yeah to be i guess honest. like i guess the question you could always ask is what replaces it it's like if champ had left the top three what replaces it? yeah tina right well tina's one of them i think tina will surpass like tina will probably second tina will probably be solidly third you don't think it's gonna get past Champagne? I don't think mm, not this quick, but maybe, maybe so. Um, but there's other decks to talk about here too, because we did have the rest of the decks in day two. Yeah. There was plenty of control, right? Pidgeot control, Snorlax, stall decks, some lost box throughout. I need to get the get my laptop charger right over there. Where should I find it? Oops. Right here. Nope. <laughs> It's downstairs. All right. We're going to have to pause in a second to go get it. But real quick, I just want to finish this thought. Um, yeah. You know, we do have the control decks still doing pretty well. And then uh, Gardevoir, pretty low meta share. But I think that's something that's going to change pretty soon as well. Yeah, because we did see a couple. I got decent, 19%. We're good for it. Uh, decent placements from it. Or it's one solid placement, right? Fabian, top, or ninth. Yeah, uh, ninth. The only good. player to not make it into cut with 36 match points. Which is maybe something we could talk about as well. It's just the amount of match points you need to take make top eight at these tournaments. Uh, and I believe there was a top thirty two. Uh, oh, Piper played it as well. Piper, Piper got actually eighteenth with the yeah. with the guard vor. And then Stefan was the same list yeah. as Fabian. I believe they were on the same sixty. Nope, nope. There's a difference in there somewhere. But yeah, I think that it's another situation, right? There's it's a deck that. Um, I don't know if people necessarily thought it was good, right? I mean, I think everyone knew it was, like, fine still. It lost a lot to the rotation, right? Yeah. Um, it's, like, definitely just, like, a different style of deck, right? Like, Drifloon is kind of your main guy. Screamtail, you know, the tools, right? It's, like, a, it's a different setup for sure. Um, and it's, like, yeah, now that... this It's another deck that now that there's a good list out there, uh, it's more of a point for people to, like, imitate, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. So, it'll be a big deck that I think people will flock to as well because it's kind of a mainstay for a little while. And, yeah, I don't think too much. Like, the deck is still solid, for sure. Like, is still solid. Just a different build now with the uh, with the tool build. And, yeah, something to work around, which is, like, always, like, a big thing for people to, like, play off of. And that's probably, like, like even talking about Maridon after LAIC, right? People thought Maridon was, like, a dead deck, not very good anymore, unplayable. And then Juho wins, gets things cooking, um, and then people kind of like take off from there with it. So I think Garvel will be another deck that pops up. It didn't get like a top eight finish, which I think like the deeper you go, the more influence it has. For of course, sure. yeah. But yeah, Fabian was right there, and then you have someone even like Stefan who plays top thirty two with it. Who that's like still a that's like a player a lot of people look at, right? Uh, yeah, and. Seeing someone like Stefan, whatever Stefan chose to play, as long as he does decently well with it, which top 32 isn't bad, right? People are going to look at that and be like, oh, wait, what's going on here? Stefan's playing guard for. All right, let me take a look at that look at this list. Try it out. Yeah. And let's take a look now. Yeah, we can go ahead and look at the top eight decks. And let's start with the winning deck, Tor Dreklev's fifth IC win, which is disgusting. <laughs> and it was with. Good old Charizard. Yeah, so nothing... Uh, well, I guess a couple things crazy, actually. I guess I say nothing too crazy. But there's a couple things that are interesting, right? It is Pidgeot Charizard, but yep. did include the 1-1 one, one B-Barrel. So some extra draw power for... I mean, any matchup. Obviously, you can only quick search once per game, or per turn, excuse me. Even if you set up two Pidgeots. Although, was that someone on stream who did that once? They set up a second Pidgeot... And they tried to quick search with Did it. Did they? Yeah, who, where was that? What I don't remember was that? that. It was a tournament. Was it, it must have been one that you watched on your show. Yeah, um, yeah you can't do that. Uh, but <laughs> It does say on the card, Yeah, once per turn. Know. So the B-Barrel gives you extra draw power every matchup, every scenario. It's a lot easier to more aggressively get your setup Pokemon into to be set up because of the now. Uh, you just have to like play the B-Barrel, obviously. Um, and it's really, really good. Um, full card when going up against decks that play the TM Devo, which a lot of the top players chose to play in their Charizard yeah. builds. William actually played two of them in his top four Charizard list. Uh, and then the other standout cards here, of course, the Cleffa, really, really powerful against Spiritomb and Fluttermane. 
Uh, and actually, Flutter Mane wasn't even a card that I really thought about that it's good against. But if you go up against one of those ancient boxes, yeah, they open up that Flutter Mane, or go up against the Guardi, because Fabian and Stefan they both play Klepti and Flutter Mane. The Klepti can be used under that, or the more most common card probably, and the most useful of those cards in general is, is generally Spiritum because it's also so powerful against control. So that also shuts down your Rotom, but the Klepti can get over that, give you some early game draw power. Of course, still going to be locked out of your Luminine in the late game against the Spiritum, but setting up more importance than worrying about the late game on turn two. And then the uh, most, every Zard player played some kind of cards to help beat control or to like out-resource the yeah. Zard mirror. Tor didn't really play anything for the mirror match, but besides I guess like the Defiance band kind of stands out the most. Um, but did play two Turo in Team Yell's Cheer. Yeah. Which is a package for the control matchup more so than anything. Turos can be good in the mirror as well. You know, pick up your Lumini and pick up your Rotom. I'll even pick up a damaged Zard at some point. Yeah. Still had the class in there as well, so a ton of bench control. Uh, from towards build, and I guess in the mirror match as well, you could team yells cheer boss's orders back to the deck. But yeah, that's okay. Like two boss and a prime catcher plus a counter catcher. It's also another way that. to recover Pokemon too. Right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You can recover Pokemon, but still have the two super rod in there. Uh, on top of that, so I actually saw someone tweeted out. It was uh, Cyrus. Uh, yeah, Cyrus tweeted out that the player who got second at Vancouver Regionals apparently didn't know you could team yells cheer for Pokemon back. Yeah. Uh, constantly reminded of that as. Almost never use it for that, but actually, doing that in control is actually pretty powerful because it allows you to like get back like two pennies plus a Snorlax or something to continue your chain. Um, so yeah, you can do that as well with the Team Yield Share, which I guess can like stop Mantine, right? You can like Ultra Ball plus Team Yield Share against control, but the two Turtles plus the Team Yield Share that combo of being able to use Turtle four times or something like that is what gives this build a chance yeah. of beating control. Yeah, it's not about going like trying to do something infinitely like you might would with a Regieleki type strategy which is what a lot of yeah uh, which is what a lot of people play. landed on it's about just doing enough to, to win. win the game yeah. right just be aggressive you don't have to uh yeah you don't have to, you don't have to match do it in. forever right yeah we're yeah. Just trying to match them in the resource yeah. like like listen you have your silene you yellow chair you have infinite resources that's cool but if i punch you enough times it doesn't matter if you have infinite um because if it takes you too long to so, utilize those resources I think what the interesting thing is going to be, so looking at this list and this package, right, uh, obviously Yell's Cheer and Turo, they're kind of more techs for the meta, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas something like the decision to play Pidgeot, Bibarel, Cleffa, and Rotom, all four of those cards is just kind of a, a choice. I mean, it's a little bit based on the meta, right? But mostly just based on the the deck right just mostly like these are the cards this is like what is good in this deck is playing these cards right um I mean, I feel and like... towards mind so is that i think the question is is like is does this become the normal charizard engine moving forward pidgeot bibarel rotom cleffa i could see it i think the bibarels are because of tm diva more so than anything i don't know if you'd run bibarel without tm diva being present mm -hmm. uh, i mean the draw power is super nice yeah he talked about how it's just pretty good like even like yeah, I mean, yeah it's not just bad, getting right? ionoed like Bieber Sometimes you need more than one thing, right? Pidgeot yeah. only gets you one thing. And speaking to that, that's why people started playing Roxanne in Charizard, was like, I need to disrupt my opponent, but I also want to be able to do something next turn. Yeah, and and I... If you Iono your opponent down to two and put yourself down to like three or something, like, sure, you disrupted them, but if you don't have a follow-up, then who cares if you disrupted them? They get a free turn to like just reset up, and then maybe they still take over the game again. But that's what the Roxanne's really good at. You disrupt mm -hmm. your opponent, you get six cards yourself, and it gives you enough resources plus the quick search to actually be able to pull off a very powerful follow-up play. Yeah. Um, and the B-Barrel can do the same thing when your opponent's hitting you with the, the Ionos, the, the Rock Sands. It allows you to have, like, a more powerful turn. So, yeah, the B-Barrel is just kind of good uh, in general, for sure. Um, and, yeah, maybe that will be the standard moving forward. I guess you... I guess maybe the Cleffa also just, like, is Spiritum going to go away with how good control is right now? Probably mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Um, so maybe the question becomes, should you still play Rotom and the Forest Shieldstone package? Is that worth including still? Yeah, that's the next evolution, probably, of this list, is, like, getting to a point where you think about removing... Rotom and Forest Seal Stone. And if you're removing that, are we removing Luminion too? Luminion's pretty good. I don't know. Do you have to change the Arv like Arvin's value goes down a lot when you don't have Forest Seal Stone in your deck as well. That's right? true. That's true. Yeah. Do we get to a point where Zard is not an Arvin deck? What about just like 2 2 B Barrel and 2 2 Pidgeot? Pidgeot. 2 0 2 Pidgeot. Yeah. yeah. And then just know. Cleffa. Yeah, that, that's actually interesting. Yeah, we could see it we evolve. Got time for Orlando, but. <laughs> <laughs> we could see it evolve. Pat I mean, still Zard mirrors in general. There's so many of them. They're so wonky. Yeah. yeah. Um,. They are interesting to play and stuff like that, but yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be... That was one of the reasons we didn't really want to play Charizard either, just like, we know the control stuff exists, do we really want to walk into a tournament where we don't know how many Mist Energy and Devos 
potentially like Temple of Sinnohs do they have? Should we play the Mist? And we saw the two top placing lists not running the Sinnoh. I guess you could move to the next Zard list next, right? And look, talk about Williams. Yeah. Zard, uh, Zard, or not Zard, William and Tord both choosing to not bring the uh, Mist Energy was interesting because it's, it's really good against TM Devo. Um, it's okay. it's not that good against Cena. I'm not gonna lie, it's not that good against Cena. I was never afraid of it. My opponent put it down. I either had my Sinnoh or I had uh, the Verzian. So yeah. Um, but other techs, right? And and the William build is way more geared towards the mirror match. Yes. Right. He's got the double Devo. He's got the Eerie as well, which is also good against Chien Pao. He's got Maximum Belt, which is also really good in the mirror match. Yeah. Um. Uh, Pal Pad. So it has yeah. like more resources to work with. Has the Turtle. Has the collapsed. So a lot of resources for uh, probably a little bit worse of a time against control, right? And that's one thing we can talk to you quickly about towards control package is there's no way for control to interact with those cards besides Luxray, right? Yes. Luxray is the only card that can mess with Turos and the Team Yell's Cheer. Yeah, and that's why Tor chose to play the Team Yell's Cheer, I assume, over just a pal pad because it's like the control player cannot interact with Team Yell's Cheer unless they have Luxray which most control players play, but can they get it on that turn? And Quad Lax never plays. Right? And then also, if they put that in play... That's a two-prizer. It's a two-prizer. He has Choice Belt, right? He can knock it out, yep. even if they've not taken any prizes. So. Yeah. So, like, when you look at this build from William, it's like, it's better for the mirror, I would say. No B-Barrel, though. Maybe is the B-Barrel that strong of a difference that... Does B-Barrel make up for no TM Devos, no Eerie? Possible. Um, but I would say I'd probably give William the edge overall. Yeah. Also... If there was no time in top cut, William pr probably beats Tord in top four as yep. well. Yeah. Uh, with the double Devo, because Tord didn't know about the second Devo. Yeah, so it was about it could have come yeah. online that turn. I think I might have just given William the William the game if William had a couple more turns. Yeah. Devo the board, and then Boss KO the Radiant Zard, and then I think the game was basically over. Yeah. Um. So yeah, much more geared towards mirror match. But like I said, yeah, is the B barrel the difference maker? Anyways, is consistency and just power, because B barrel makes your deck more powerful neutrally. These techs are good in mirror, but does it overcome the neutral power? I'm actually not sure. That would actually be something. That's kind of interesting too, because to so towards like always been like his deck building innovation for the longest time, right? When he won in AIC, when he won EUIC with Zoropod, right? Uh, his decks were just very streamlined, very consistent, yeah. very straightforward. No, no real flair, honestly. Yeah, he's got a bit of flair in here, right? Like you know, I, but at the same time, it's less concerned. He's like concerned. Very it's like so interesting. Control. He's it's... very much concerned with control, but less concerned with mirror almost. Yeah. Because like Prime Catcher, just kind of the neutrally best A spec, right? But much worse into the mirror match when your opponent has maximum belt and you are working with Prime Catcher. And Prime Catcher maybe lets you be a little bit more aggressive, and that's where it becomes stronger. That's kind of gonna be one of the most interesting things to me, I think, moving into Orlando is which A spec do Charizard players land on. Yeah, because Prime Catcher is just so much good against everything else. So much yes. better against everything else. Except um, Chien Pao. That's another reason that Maximum Belt's really good. It's a good good against Chien Pao. Because you can it's, Yeah, a, it's good against Chien Pao, yeah. Yeah. But still being able to go, like, turn two Prime Catcher. It's good against Iron Hands Bidu stuff as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, same thing with Iron Hands, though. It's just, like, if you can just get it around. If you have the answer to their baton, you get a first two prize lock, you're just winning anyways as well. So, sure. So. Yeah, it's definitely interesting for sure. Like, I, I, I wouldn't even say for sure that Maximum Belt is better in the mirror than the prime catcher because it yeah they're definitely offers different plays the prime catcher is like or the maximum belt is like if you draw perfectly maximum belt's better that's right for sure if you draw well maximum belt is better but it's like the prime catcher covers such a wider array of scenarios right um but yeah that is like another thing that comes up here for sure it's just a more powerful card overall now your group was not the only testing group that came packed with a lost tina list we also saw bradner and company bring one to the event and isaiah ended up with his second second place finish at an ic uh with the lost on giratina uh yeah a bit different from your list obviously the main thing that sticks out is the bonnet right you get the bonnet ex and also the puppet offering bonnet yep um which is really cool because like it's two cards that do useful things that are evolutions that come from the same basic, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like you wouldn't play two one one lines if like it was a Benetti X and then instead of the puppet offering it was like I don't know some other stage one ghost type like a haunter I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't play that, but uh, because they all come from the same thing, it, it 
is much more consistent, pretty cool. Um, and then also there's no water energies in here, so no uh, opportunity to attack with Radiant Greninja. And did have the Force Seal Stone as well. Those are kind of the big standout things to me as far as differences between their list and y'all's. Yeah, so I went with this uh, Bonnet package, which is definitely interesting. Basically, auto wins the Chi and Pao matchup, which was the second most popular deck in the tournament. It did for, like it was up there at the top tables for a while. Um, I saw Bradner beat one or two Chi and Pao's with it throughout the whole tournament run. I was sitting next to him a couple times, uh, and I saw him get him with the uh, get him with the item lock. And then, yeah, having the extra banana in there as well. I mean, you may as well have it in there at that point. You can also do weird stuff. Um, what was the matchup that I was kind of thinking about with the deck too? Where you can like chain banets depending on like situations because you have the double shove it. I don't know how much that actually ever comes up to be honest. Chain but... banet. It sends itself to the lost zone. No, no, no the banet, the banet ex. Like, the oh, you can out. do it you multiple times. Yeah. Oh, I don't okay, know if that ever like okay. matters that much in any matchup, but um, something like that could possibly happen. But yeah, the deck is really cool. I think the um, banet, the puppet offering one is really cool too because you can like turn three stabilize stuff, right? Especially because they also have yeah. uh, the four seal stone, right? Like you can pull those things off a little. Yeah, can consistently you ramp like, ramp the loss on really really aggressively. Yeah, which probably doesn't matter that much. Um, but yeah, I guess it like gets you gets you to like that turn two Tina more consistently, just to get to the seven, um, so you can get there more aggressively. Uh, it's definitely very interesting. I, moving forward, I'm not too sh sure how much the beta is worth it still, because uh, like, like I said, I expect Champ to kind of drop in popularity. Um, the one thing about it though is like even if Champ knows you play the Benetti X, they can't really do anything about it. Because you start, you just start slapping them with a Tina, and it's like, well, they gotta answer the Tina. They can't not answer the Tina. Are you gonna boss KO or shop it on the bench and let them hit you with Tina again? Probably not. So you knock out the Tina, and then they go into the Bennett, and then you kind of it starts to crumble from there. You could also double shop it as well. Yeah, the only thing like they, that people probably could have done against Bradder that maybe some had the opportunity to turn to would be the cancel Cologne play, where you cancel Cologne, you KO the shoppers off the bench, you wipe them out. So item lock's not a possibility. But uh, quite a few people didn't play the cancel Cologne. And I saw some tweets from some people where, like, they played it, but they never used it. And honestly, I, I don't think the Clancy Clones that... It's so hard to pull off before a deck gets out of range of it mattering. Sure. So the Clancy Clones... Like, you have to do it pretty forward. quick, usually, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we'll see people keep it moving forward. So that, like, increases the value of the Bennett, um overall. So, yeah, I don't know if it's... I don't know if the... Having played zero games with this Bennett build, but, you know, quite a few games now with the build that I played at UIC, I definitely like the build that... Me and the, the squad played. There definitely some changes I would make to it, but this build is like I don't know. I don't, I don't know if the net's worth keeping it. If it's a, if it should be a staple in Tina from now on, as compared to just being more consistent. Um, but I guess you could make the argument that the puppet offering is consistency, right? At the end of the day, sure. So yeah, definitely cool. I think it did. I mean, it obviously did what Bradner needed it to do for that tournament, right? So it did. It got it got him there. Um, Oh, well, one weird thing you can do with the banana as well is actually in the Charizard matchup, because they only play the one Charmeleon, you can, like, potentially early game item lock for, like, the first two prize cards, mm -hmm. and then get your prize lead that way while you sit there and cold a bunch of times. And then once they finally find Charmeleon, if they find Charmeleon, also if they pry Charmeleon, they literally just lose. Yeah. Until they get to, like, a Radzard situation. Sure. Um, but by then you could have drawn, like, three or four prize cards. You're ahead. Uh, yeah. Or you just wait until you can lost mine, right? You sit there and item lock them, you lost mine, take, like, three... Uh, three or four prize cards, so that's like something cool that can happen in the matchup because there's only the one Charmeleon and Charizard and finding it can be an issue um, and prizing it is like a possibility, but yeah, I'm not sure if it should be a staple or not moving forward to be honest. I, I think maybe it just comes down to like Chain Pass popularity. There were a couple control decks in the top eight, both pretty different. We did have Alessandro Crimescoli with the Pidgeot control. No block lax, none yeah, that's at all. Interesting for sure. He did have the Noivern in here, which is pretty interesting to see. Also had Roseanne's backup, you know, a way you can reuse the hero's cape, reuse, you know, any of your one of Pokemon. Uh, oh yeah, I can't get back. I didn't even, yeah, I can't get back hero's cape. It gets back so much, dude. <laughs> yeah, double you can get back everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a pretty cool card. And then we also had Burt Walters with also Pidgeot Control, but his much more Snorlax focus. Yeah, he stole straight. Alessandro's Snorlax. That's why Alessandro had zero. Burt had three, which is it's really interesting to see both of these lists because most lists I've seen for this deck, last format, this format, have had like one Snorlax, two maybe. But we see Burt with the three, Alessandro with zero. They both made top eight. <laughs> How many should you play? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Burt's was also more aggressive towards attacking with Charizard, like uh, had the potential to do that. Uh, he has the Magma Basin in there. Alessandro does not have the Magma Basin yeah. as an option. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just like one of these like 
decks that you're just looking to have answers to whatever your opponent's doing. Just mess with your opponent enough. Yeah, you basically and then the you eventually possible. win with Chiyu, or you eventually win uh, by taking all your prize cards, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot this deck can do, a lot of shenanigans, a lot of locks, a lot of traps. Like, yeah, it's a really interesting deck for sure. What do you think of the Bufalant in Alessandro's list? Yeah, I'm not sure about the Buffalo. I'm not sure what that runs up against. It's good against Tina. The like, last one was pretty good against Alessandra Tina. Alessandra did. Put see. a cape on it. 230. Uh, this is twirling. Here it is. Okay, yeah. Alessandra did tweet out a pretty long explanation thread about his deck and all of the... Leaking the secret? Yeah, he's put it out there for everyone, you know. Uh, for Snorlax, he said that there was too many boss and ways to avoid it, so he didn't think it was a solid win condition Got rid of it. I just feel like Snorlax is so annoying early game. Also, sure. when you look at like Alessandro's list, like the one thing that stands out to me is like, I mean, what do you like? Obviously, like if you don't need Noibat in the like, depending on, like what do you put in your active early? Luxury using Luxury early is obviously really really good. Yeah, I think it's probably um, mostly that. Maybe Q's Mimikyu, annoying. Yeah. Um, but like all these things are one ofs, and they all can be like good in situations. So it's like Snorlax is like always a good center up. Yeah. And it's always game, it can always yeah. you can always force your opponent to play the game right with Snorlax. Like, oh, I'm setting this up and bring this thing up off your bench. Now you got to find a way to move it, but. Yeah, Alessandro is the mastermind, so I'm not going to overly question it. And then for Neuvern, he said he tried many ways to beat Lugi, and none of them seemed efficient, so he played Neuvern to improve matchups like Moon in Ancient Box. Okay, so he just gave up completely on the Lugia. On Lugia, matchup. yeah. For the energies, uh, he said he used the Mist on Neuvern against Moon and to avoid Devolution for Pidgeot. Having uh, more energies was good overall, though. And then for Trainers... Devolution, one more win condition against Zard and Chien Pao. Eerie, overall amazing supporter. Thornton, it's a part of the Neuvern combo, but I also used it for Buffalant and Zard. Mm -hmm. Every card in the deck is pure essential, and if, if it's not in here, uh, and it's not, if, if it's not in here, it wasn't. So, like, uh, if it wasn't, if it's not, it, basically, he's saying he had the perfect 60. Okay. So, yeah. Perfect 60, except there's no way to interact with your prize. I think you also just lose. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, in yeah. in his top four match or top eight match against uh, the Roaring Moon deck, which we'll talk about here, in a uh, he won game one. But then in, in game two, his last prize was his Neuvern EX, mm. and almost lost because of it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, that's something we could like mention here real fast. Is like leading up to this tournament, I've been seeing a lot of control decks. They have the the Daisy Arc Daisy, Phone combo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, Alessandro and I actually like the idea of not just like like. I like the, of course he I plays played, enough stuff. Yeah, I played know? nothing, no games with control. So, like, I don't really have that strong of an opinion on it. But, like, I like the idea of not playing those cards because it's like, that just sounds like, so, like, just hoping, like, whatever you have, just work with it. Like, here yeah. we go. Um, and it's cool to see it's winning with that that line of strategy and, as opposed to trying to, like, fit the phone and the daisy in there, which is just, like, two dead cards. They're not. They're not disruptive cards, right? And they're not yeah. they're not pure setup cards like another Arvid. Yeah, drawing thing. two cards with Daisy's help isn't gonna really get you very far most of the time. Yeah. So I guess, that must be the biggest reason that we see that Bert has the Snoraxes in there, also has the Giacomo. So it was trying to not beat Lugia, but give himself a chance against Lugia. And it and it definitely comes down to Snorlax plus Giacomo for sure. Uh, but you definitely need both of those cards. So it was trying to have a chance against it. Yeah. But we see Alessandro was like, Nope, not worth it. No Snorlax, no Giacomo. I'll take the L. Then there were a pair of Iron Hands players in Top Cut. We've got Ufi, Axelin, Axelson. I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. And of course, Yuho Kalama, our uh, LAIC champion, getting back to back IC top eights, which is it's pretty, pretty good. impressive. So shout outs to Yuho for a sick tournament run. Also, Yuho was. He was in his stream game, and I noticed this sitting backstage in our green room watching the match. He literally was, uh, he drew a, a hand off of research or something like that, and he was playing with his champion Ultra Ball from LAIC, which is such a flex, super sick. For anyone who doesn't know, that card's probably worth like, I don't know, like three grand or something like that. Yeah, like, three to five grand. Yeah, probably. they're expensive. Uh, so that was pretty sick. Uh, yeah. And yeah, shout outs to both these players with the Iron Hands, Iron I thought, Crown I thought... deck. I thought Yuho's list was a little bit more interesting. But the two cards that both players are playing there are kind of unique is the Erica's Invitation yep. from Ufi, and then Yuho uh, played the TM Evolution Crisis Punch. Yes. Which is, uh, well, not TM Evolution, TM, Technical, Technical Machine, machine. Yeah. Uh, Crisis Punch, 
which is definitely interesting. But allowed to get that 280 at the end. Good against Tina, I would assume. Well, it does more than 280 um, as well. That's true, because they're all the... Yep. Probably, yeah, they're probably pretty good against Tina, and maybe another closer against Charizard, another way to want to kill Charizard at the end, right? Also, like, sometimes if you don't have a Iron Hands on your bench, but you have a Baton on your hands, hands yeah. you can throw your energies onto a crown so that your crown can actually, like, it makes it so your crown can do something right. Yeah. So Charizard players... I wouldn't have expected it. Think twice before you kill that Moridon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because as you get to the end of the game, that Crisis Punch could come out. Yeah. So that's something to think about moving forward. Uh, and then, yeah, the Erica's Invitation was cute from, from Ufe as well. So, like... I think too outstanding. There was a couple players. I think Ufe said he did not really use it very much. I will say. Yeah, I mean it's probably a hard card to pull off. <clears throat> um, people have full benches a lot, and usually have like a decent amount of targets in play too. So you'd rather yeah. just boss and guarantee something. But it's an interesting card for sure. I don't know if it's worth playing going forwards. Um, might be though. Who knows? Uh, and then, yeah, the, I guess the only other deck in top eight is Warren Moon, right? Yeah, so this is from Mark uh, Holstrump. I don't know how to pronounce the little O with the slash through it, so excuse my American there. Maybe there's not supposed to be an O. It's like slashing out the O. It's like no O. So, so why is it there? Just how they spell it. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no O, don't put the O there, you know? It's different over just there. It, they're just built different, you know? Uh, different. But yeah, I tweeted out earlier, I thought this was the coolest deck in top eight. By far, right? It's not even yeah. close. <laughs> the Dunsparce? Are you kidding me? Like, that's pretty sweet. Uh, but yeah, this deck is super cool. I mean, it's pretty... This is like... Uh, we were talking earlier about how, like, Tord is known for, like, his consistency streamlined, right? Like, this is, like, a pretty consistent streamlined build of, like, just a Roaring Moon deck, right? You just attack with the little one, put on pressure early... Use the big one to take one-hit KOs. The Dunsparce is great against Ionos and Roxanne's at the end of the game. Uh, Dunsparce has free retreat, which is pretty That's, sweet. No, it's broken right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this this deck is super cool, honestly. Yeah, I have no idea what to really think about this, to be honest, because I haven't played with it at all. But yeah, definitely cool. And I thought about the matchups a little bit. And I see that it, in my head, I'm like, yeah, you should be able to prize trade against most decks right you got the baby moon early to draw those one prize ko's you can make it big with the booster capsules as well yep. and then you get into the frenzied gougings and then the 220s against stuff like chin pow and then you got the dance force so you're not just losing to roxanne and iono at the end of every single game and the reason that the dance force is, is in here over something like b barrel for anyone who wasn't curious why there's not just a 3-3 b barrel here it's because your hands get so big in these ancient decks yeah sada three in the hand use greninja draw two to the hand yep you know, you just build up your hand. Explorer's really, really Guidance big. draws adds two cards to your hand, right? Yeah, so your hands just get built up in the mid-game. So you want to be very, drawing very many cards with B-Barrel. So instead, you have the Dunsparce Parse in here. allows you to cycle through your deck, just draw cards that way. And then gives you some, some kind of draw power still towards the late game as well. I wonder if something like Lipart would ever be good. In, instead of the Dunsparce? Parse? Mm -hmm. Maybe. What is the Dunsparce play? It says draw three first and then shuffle, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can yeah. use it while it's active as well, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So you can like you can't get trapped. You can like promote it and then dark patch to your bench and then use and yeah, it also can't get trapped. It so you can set up uh, cool boards against control where it's like yeah. you have three moons and play with energy and three Dunsparce. Yeah. <laughs> and then and they, your rating Greninja cannot get air cast. Yeah. 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 Definitely cool. So yeah, really cool build. I think this if this deck is as good as it I don't even want to say as it seems. If this deck is good. Yeah, this will become one of those popular decks in the format for sure. It'll be like Roaring Moon from last format, where it's just like I could see it honestly, like because it's pretty streamlined, right? Yeah, it's straight pretty forward, straightforward, aggressive. pretty consistent. Yeah, and there's like benefits to playing a deck like this, right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel every format. Nope. Like just sometimes just punching your opponent is really good. Yeah, like in game, in game, in game, in game. Well, I mean, it's what you got to do, but <laughs> he said it. He said it, not me. <laughs> Leave me out of your support tickets, people. <laughs> um... Yeah, it, I don't know if the deck's good, though, right? Like, it did get top eight, but that that's, like, I know a lot yeah, of people sure. are going to be like, oh, it got top eight, how is it? What do you mean? It might not be good. Like, the deck is good. Um, but is it going to become a meta deck? Is yeah. it actually good enough to compete for championships? Yes. Maybe, we'll see. Um, but it seems like it definitely has the potential here, for sure. So, I'm excited to try this deck out. And if it if it is good, if the deck is good, I think we, this will definitely become, like, a, a at least a, a top six uh, page one meta deck on the on the meta breakdowns uh, regionals. I could see it for sure. So those are our top eight decks. There are plenty of other interesting decks to look at. Um, of course, we talked about Fabian's Gardevoir. We did look at it a little bit. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I think that this is one that's going to increase in play as well because there's now a good list out there for people to look at. Um, there was Ancient Box as well at this tournament. I think a deck that people were uh, not rating super highly going in. I think it was getting a lot of disrespect from a lot of good players. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was probably better than what that deserved. Uh, and yeah, so we did see Joao here with the top 16 finish with the deck. It also did win in the seniors division, Gabriel Fernandez winning his third straight, like, major tournament, not counting regionals, right? Like, yeah, yeah. he won Worlds, he won LAIC, he won uh, EUIC this past weekend. I mean, that kid is just an absolute monster, to be honest. Yeah, going on quite the run. Also has at least won one regional this year, won the first line of yeah. regional. I don't know about the second one. Uh, it was in Charlotte, but I think got ninth. I think he did get ninth in, in Charlotte. Charlotte yeah. So, uh, but yeah, the Ancient Box... I'm still not sold. The thing that still I'm still hung up on this one, guys, is the Charizard matchup. Especially if people take after Tours list with Turos. Yeah. You're just not drawing prize cards early, and that can be tough for sure. So. This is maybe a little more consistent, right? It's like, yeah. can attack a lot. Like, you know, sometimes with Charizard, you draw your opening hand, you rotom, him, and then it's like, mm, I don't quite get a Charizard off turn two, rotom him again. This is a deck that's like pretty consistently going to attack on turn one. Well, yeah, uh, of course. Or turn two. Um,. But that's what I'm, that's what the hang up is for me with this deck for sure. sure is that matchup. But if it if it has a fine Charizard matchup, then I th it's you know reason for the deck not to be. Uh, yeah, Benny uh, had deck. in the finals at seniors finals like Benny had so many uh, texts and answers right. Yeah, had the the hero's cape. Um, but none of those things are that good against <laughs> this deck, right? I mean, I think the hero's cape can be right. Hero's cape's probably pretty good. Right? I don't think Eerie and Lucky and all that stuff takes you out of two hit KO range. Uh, no, what else did he have? He, uh, Lost City. He has Lost City. Like that's Ooh. pretty good against this deck, right? Yeah, Lost City, the Greninja. Yeah, take away that draw power. I mean, Lost City. Like even just putting ancient Pokemon in the Lost Zone so that they're not. Yeah, instead of KO. <laughs> they're not going to the discard pile to fuel the attack even more. And Gabriel uh, could have been in trouble because in game one, he used his Pokestop and milled his other two Pokestops as well. Oh, <laughs> And yeah. so had no answer to Lost City, but Benny was having a harder time getting set up and getting going and didn't have time to get the Lost City in play early enough for it yeah. to really have a big impact. But yeah. anyway, anyway. It could definitely be key, but yeah, that's like the one matchup I'm kind of hung up on. Sure. Also, it doesn't have the greatest hands matchup, right? Like that's kind of close Sure. against the, the future hands, which I think is definitely a deck that is going to uh, see a spike in popularity, especially post, well, post this tournament going or going forward because of its results, right? Mm -hmm. um, it kind of showed that it can hang uh, in general. Uh, the Charger matchup's tough, but not undoable. There was also another Roaring Moon to Dunsparce deck in top 16. Uh, Andres Torres, I believe, did he lose the win in it? I think he lost the win in it on stream. I think he was that bundle. last... Last stream match, but yeah, has, has the Bundy in here, has the Thornton. Gotta have the Thornton. Can't, can't forget that. But pretty similar to the top eight list, honestly, right? Yeah, the one thing that stands out to me, it's most, like two cards different. In these in these decks, is the Gust count only two ball, only one boss. My bad. You have the Prime Catcher, but like, yeah, it says we want to be more aggressive than that. It's like the only thing that stands one out counter to me. catcher. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, Moon showing up uh, more than with more than one place in the top sixteen, right outside of top sixteen. Arceus Armor Rouge. Right outside top 16, yeah. It's right there. Yeah, Delphox V is honestly something that just seems pretty good right now, to be honest. Um, especially, like, if someone maybe doesn't expect it necessarily, like in the new format, right? You can yeah. capitalize on a little bit of those type of things. Um, Gouging Fire, incredibly strong attacker, right? Uh, especially with 230 HP. Um you don't have to have any damage on it from Magma Basin because you can put the damage on the bench things and move them up, right, with the Armor Rouge yep. ability. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cool deck. But it's something we've... Like, I don't think... Uh, this is something that someone should be, like, surprised to see <coughs> that this is a thing that is this. Maybe a surprise to see it get that close to top 16, right? Yeah, that's something but... really interesting. I mean, when I look at this list, I was like, your Charizard seems tough still. Like you Christian uh, Labella played this deck in day two as well. That's not a surprise. Christian is definitely a yeah. Arceus enjoyer. For sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's definitely an interesting one. It's one of those decks that I would uh, definitely want to pick up, try out, just the same with the Roaring Moon. I'm definitely not like looking at them like soul. Like, okay, it seems like really, really good. There's a couple of these in um, day, too. The biggest thing is like just like when you look at decks, is like the depth of options the deck has usually is like the first thing I look at. It's like the Roaring Moon deck, Darkest Armor Rouge deck, like 
are they powerful enough without having enough options? Like, I don't really know. I mean, obviously the armor has a bunch of different attackers in there, but like, it looks like the guard war deck, and it's like, that intrigues me a little bit more uh, to potentially be a good deck, because it's like, okay, there's so much going on here. Um, so many options, so many different ways to play certain scenarios and matchups. Like, I definitely value that when I'm like looking at decks to like start trying out and stuff. Something like the guard war deck intrigues me a little bit more than the other ones. But yeah. like I said, the other ones do have their potential. We'll see how, how good they end up being. Well, let's real quick recap our predictions and how we ended up doing. So our first prediction was uh, going into UIC. We predicted how many Charizard would there be in the top 32. Azul predicted seven. I predicted nine. And the answer is exactly seven. No, it's eight. Did I miscount earlier? Three, four, one, two, five, six, seven. Unless I missed one. But I missed one. Six, seven. Oh, yeah. That's tough. <laughs> it's it would have been a tie at eight. Yeah. I think I might have counted Bert on accident as a charger because I was counting like the Pidgeot on the right side. You know? Yeah. That might have been what happened earlier. Dang it. I thought we split the difference. I was going to be excited about it. But all right, it's fine. You can have this round. Okay. Our next prediction was what region will the champion be from? Azul out of left field hit us with the Japan. Man, it was there's not even there wasn't even like any Japanese players. There was, there. A, there was few, a couple, not too many. Yeah, I thought there would have been more for sure. But uh, and what'd you predict again? Latin America. You were closer than me, I think. Yeah, William yeah. could have been right there. William was close. Almost did beat Tord as well. Yep. And then going to that finals. I mean, the finals still would have been close for sure. Yep. Um, I actually feel like I would have favored Tord's list over William's list in that matchup I as agree. well. I agree, yeah. Because um, does have the the Prime Catcher. You and know you also... can click on the little box up here, right? Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it does have the Prime Catcher and then also... I assume you prefer to look at lists like that as opposed to looking at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about the, the box. On Limitless. Uh, and then our last prediction was top three highest meta share decks. We also split the difference here. Your top three were Charizard, Chimpao, Lost Tina. And my top three were Charizard, Lugia, Iron Hands. I should have said Lugia. Like, I guess Lugia always made the most sense. And even at the tournament when we were doing our, you know, spreadsheet prep, uh, I was like, yeah, it'll be Lugia, Chimpao, two and three. I like, I knew the potential of Lost Tina, but I definitely overrated where it, where it currently stood in the meta for sure. Well, we'll talk more about the meta shift uh, heading into Orlando a little bit later, but something else that we can talk about that was announced at EUIC during the closing ceremony was they finally gave us information about the World Championships. The World Championship dates are finally here. They gave us the cute little artwork and all that stuff. We're going to get a little Snorkel Pikachu plush, I assume, probably. That's pretty cute, right? Gotta have the, Pikachu. Gotta have the Snorkel Pikachu. And, um, yeah, Worlds is going to be August 16th to 18th at the Hawaii Convention Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Uh, excited to go to Hawaii. Hawaii's dope. I've been there once before. It was definitely a fun experience, so excited to go back, have the World Championships there. I did say last podcast, was it? I don't think Hawaii is a great location for Worlds anymore. I think we've grown past that kind of as a location. I think having somewhere a little bit more reasonable for people to get to it makes sense for how big the game is now, especially for like people... Who are going just to experience the event aren't going as competitors and stuff like that. We want as many of those people to be able to show up as possible and experience the uh, the event. So I think, yeah, it'll be good to have Hawaii maybe this last time. But um, I think moving forward, I think the game has like outgrown a location like Hawaii, to be honest. Yep. Yeah, we'll see how it goes down there uh, in Hawaii this summer. It's going to be slam packed full of Pokemon players for sure. All right, so next we can talk about some new cards that have been revealed in the last week or so. Um, stuff since we recorded our last episode. And there's some pretty uh, pretty good cards, honestly, as well in this next set. So uh, most of these are coming from Mask of Change, which are cards that should be in our... Uh, what's it called? Twilight? What's it called? Masquerade. Twilight, Twilight Masquerade, Masquerade which is yeah. coming out in May 24th of this mm -hmm. year, uh, which is the weekend of Los Angeles Regional, so yet another weekend where there's a set release, but still a tournament in the old format. It yeah. is what it is. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at some of these new cards. We're going to be looking at Twan's Twitter, and then also looking over at Poke Beach. I guess we'll just look at Poke Beach for this main first one. Uh... The first reveal I saw for this card was actually the reveal of the promo box, and that is the Palafin 
EX. Um, and at first, when I saw it, it was like, this is a stage one with 340 hit points that does 250 damage for one energy. That's crazy. That's pretty good. And then you read its ability, and it's like, okay, okay, that makes sense. So, yeah, like I said, 340 HP, stage one, massive HP barrier, right? I mean, that's more than Charizard, yep. which is a stage two. Um, but, yeah, it has the ability Hero's <laughs> Spirit. Put this Pokemon into play only with the effect of Palafin's zero to hero ability. And then it's attack 250. You can't attack during your next turn for just one water energy. And the Palafin has the ability zero to hero once during your turn. Uh, it is also a stage one, by the way. Evolves from Finizen. And once during your turn, when this Pokemon moves from the active spot to the bench, you may search your deck for a Palafin EX and switch it with this Pokemon. Any attached cards, damage, counter, special conditions, turns of play, da 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 remain on the new Pokemon. And if you switch to Pokemon in this way, shuffle this card into your deck. Oh, I thought I'd put it into your hand. Was the first translation that I read and put it into your hand? You switch this Pokemon this way, shuffle this card into your deck. I thought it was put it into your hand. I think the... That might be wrong here. We can look on the... Uh... But I think I saw this translation on Pogo Beach. So I think maybe... I've seen it twice now. Yeah, well, they revealed the box somewhere. Did Pogo Beach post the box? No clue. And in the box, you can see the... Yeah, here it is. You can see the... Oh, well, now it should definitely be corrected, I feel like. Yeah, it says into your hand. Oh, it doesn't. It's it. They're assuming it says into your hand, but it says into your deck. Put this card into your deck and then shuffle it. Yeah. So we don't know for sure, or we do know. Put this card into your into blank shuffle blank your deck. But I mean, I think we could go with whatever the. Oh well, it says yeah, it says blank your deck, so it'd be saying shuffle your deck. We want to shuffle your deck if it went to your hand, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, because you're pulling the the other one out of your deck, right? Oh, true. Yeah. Um, so it could go into your hand or into your deck? I would go with what this translation says. Yeah, that's true. Shuffle it into your deck. Okay. Yeah, so it definitely seems like a pretty powerful card, right? It's just like the stats are super high. We've said this before. Once the stats get high enough, it doesn't really matter if it has a broken effect or a broken ability. I mean, 340 HP doing 250 damage for one water energy is pretty good. And I think we have enough Switch cards in the format to support the... For some the reason, I thought you couldn't do this the turn that the Palafin came into play, but I must have not... Heard that correct. I and mean, it doesn't seem... It wouldn't be very good, because it's effectively a stage two. It would be two. effectively a stage two. Yeah. But then, would that... I mean, this seems broken to me. Am, <laughs> I, am I crazy? Like, does this not just seem broken? I mean, you don't want it's to not... KO anything. It has 340 yeah, no, 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 saying yeah. Weak to lightning. Weak to lightning. That's not great. You don't want to KO anything. There is other... You want to KO all of the basic Paradox Pokemon, dude. Yeah. That's, that's plenty of things. Okay, you want to KO every basic Pokemon V. Yeah. That's plenty of things, right? That's plenty of things, yeah. I'm talking about talking about a drawbacks here, though. Okay, we're coming up a little bit short. I'm saying that this thing is broken. This it still thing has is Irida. Filthy. Irida it, seems pretty good. This thing is filthy, Phineas man. and Kent does have 70 HP, so it can be searched out with the Buddy Poffin. There are other Palfins you can play as well, right? There are some other Palfins that potentially be included. I don't think there's any good ones. I don't actually think there's a power. Oh, no, there is that... Uh, there's two, uh, there's two Palafins. Yeah, there's the one that's the cool-looking card, right? The, the Justice Punch Kick. One. Oh, the Jump Punch one could be good, actually. Yeah, so this attack... So have your, two your 250s. Yeah, 30 damage to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon, and also 30 to the active, and then Justice Kick for two water, 210. But it has to move from the bench to the active. Um, Which would combo with getting a, an EX into play. But... What I want to say is, like, this is just, like, a really cool, unique mechanic. I don't actually know that we've seen anything like this before, right? Where it, like, moves to the bench, you swap it with one from your deck. Yeah, I don't think so. It's pretty cool and unique. Uh, and it is on brand and, like, fits with the, like, what this Pokemon does in the video games as well. It's like you send Palafin out into battle, and then it has to switch out, and then the next uh -huh. time you send it out, it's in the hero mode. Interesting. Is it good in the video game at all? It was broken in, like, their early format. Okay. Um, and it has, like, mega-boosted stats. Like, it, it has, yeah. like, the highest attack stat in the game or something like Just that. Just like this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was broken. Um, but, like, when legendaries and stuff started being allowed, it wasn't as good. Yeah, yeah. So it it's seems... like a little bit of work to set up in the yeah. new game. I mean, it seems good. Once again, we have to wait and see, play with the card as always, but excited for it. I'm excited for a lot of the, the cards that are coming out of this, to be honest. Uh, we've got a supporter here, Hassel. It says, you can only play this card if one of your Pokemon was knocked out during your opponent's last turn. Look at the top eight cards of your deck, put up to three of them into your hand, and then shuffle the rest into your deck. This card seems pretty cool to me. 
see it being like a tech in certain decks similar to Raihan. I guess Raihan would have been a little... Uh, Raihan's different because it like got energy in play, which is like the main thing yeah. you really cared about with a lot of the decks was keeping the tempo there. I mean, I think this card probably combos really well with Quick Search Pidgeot. Something gets knocked out. It's probably decent in like a stage two deck, right? Yeah. Where you need multiple things. Yeah, Candy and combo it with the, with counter the Pidgeot. Counter combos, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So we could just see this be played in uh, Pidgeot decks maybe or something like that. I guess also as a follow-up, or as like a, you know, you push your Cleffa, draws cards, they knock out your Cleffa, then you go, okay, cool, whatever the name of the supporter is, uh, hassle, just dig for stuff, right? Yeah. Maybe it replaces Arvin or something like that. We've got Legacy Energy. While it's attached to a Pokemon, this card provides one energy of any type, so it's Rainbow Energy, and then when the Pokemon this card is attached to is KO'd by damage from your opponent's Pokemon's attack, they take one fewer prize card. It's pretty good. It is a very good card. And then only apply this effect for your Legacy Energy once per game. So even if you recycle card, it, yeah. you can't utilize it multiple times. However, if your opponent, like, Enhance Hammers it away, which we'll get before we get this card, or as we get this card, we'll get Yes, it. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, we'll get Enhance Hammer as we get this card. You could recover it and then still try and get the effect of its uh, the fewer prize cards. But it seems really good. It's going to be really good in Lugia. Right? This is a good Lugia. Yeah, that was one of the first things I saw people point out is that you can now play Iron Hands and Lugia. People have been yep. looking for ways to play Iron Hands and Lugia basically since Iron Hands came out because Lugia has a broken ability, because Archeops has a broken ability, right? And Iron Hands is a broken attacker. Iron Hands is a broken <laughs> attacker. And uh, something else as well. I mean, do you remember what was one of the best things to do with Lugia back in the broken Lugia format? What was your best attacker that you used like almost every turn? A certain Pokemon that you would put back into your deck. Oh, Luminian. Luminian. Ooh, I didn't even think about that. Gives you a way to attack with Luminian. That is true. And cycle it. Yeah. Because that was like one thing that would come up. It's like you lose, you lose so many games because Luminian gets stuck in play and then gets KO'd. Yep. So that is a pretty cool you get a way to cycle a bonus it. there. Yeah. You don't have to play yeah, Collapse like necessarily, necessarily anymore. You could yep. play uh, Mesagoza now to up that consistency a little bit. Pretty cool. Uh, another pretty cool card is the Dragapult EX. This one seems insanely good. Stage 2 Pokemon, 320 HP Dragon-type Pokemon with the attack Jet Headbutt for a colorless. It deals 70 damage. Not oh, bad. Not bad. Not complaining. And then it's big attack here for a fire and a color... Uh, sorry, a fire and a psychic energy. <laughs> Phantom Dive, 200 damage. Put 6 damage counters on your opponent's benched Pokemon in any way that you like. So it's not, I mean, it's basically Dragon Ball VMAX, right? It's the, yeah, the reimagining yeah. of Dragon Ball VMAX, right? Um, 130 opponents active, 52 opponents in benchmark one anyway you like. This yep. one has been ramped up a little bit. 260, but it is that fire psychic. But the stats on this are insane, right? Yeah, high HP. Two energy for 200 damage, then 50 spread or 60 spread. The TM Devo potential with this card is insane. Yep. Uh, and then, like, another big point here is we look at the stage one. Yep. The Dracloak has the ability, once on your turn, you may look at the top two cards of your deck, put one in your hand and put the rest on the bottom of your deck. It's got some built-in draw power through its stage one, which is generally a good sign of a really good stage two. Is like, all right, we're utilizing the whole line. You have to put the basic in play first. Becomes a stage one. Yep. Some form of draw power or search engine. Yeah. Are we even the broken attacker playing rare candy in this deck? Like, I mean, I guess Team you probably you, you probably play one, right? Like, it's still or one or two. Like, it's probably still worth it to have that quick threat, but maybe. But Team Evolution uh, is also, the way to go. Is this the place where Neo Upper Energy works? Yeah, I mean, it definitely stands out. I mean, the new energy works with kind of as it does. Right? Yeah, it could be in the psychic or the fire. Um, that is definitely the big detractor of this card. Is the two different energy types. Like, yeah. balancing that is probably the most annoying aspect We do have Vessel, though. So, yeah. um, and, like, theoretically, you could play Mela as well uh, to accelerate the fire Dude. to your second. Dude, you know what? You know what you could play this with? Huh. A certain Dragon-type V-Star Pokemon that lets you copy the attacks of your Dragon-type Pokemon in your discard pile. Oh, true. Reggie Drago V-Star. Reggie Drago V-Star. Is this finally his moment? Is this finally the time? I don't know. The attack's good? The attack's good? The attack is pretty good. Is it that good. one better than the other attacks? I'd... And is it... Do you need the consistency <clears throat> of the Dracloak to help you out there? Probably. I feel like by itself it's probably going to be better. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Reggie Drago's ever going to be in this moment. I think it... It's, it's time like, to it's have its moment. It never happens. It's like Zoro V... It's a, it's a new Zorark 
Zoro Box. Sure. Where it's like every... No, Zoro Box had its moment. Shout outs to Kobe. No. At the very end, moment. Vancouver Regionals, top 16. I mean, it had better moments before. They got like ninth at a couple. Yeah. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. It'll never be it'll never be enough to make it a meta deck. So a new thing will keep coming out like, okay, yeah. is this finally are we there? We're never there yet. And then it gets rotated. We've got an item card here, performance flute. Your opponent reveals the top five cards of their deck. Put any number of basic Pokemon you find there <clears throat> onto your opponent's bench. Your opponent shuffles the other cards into their deck. So another thing for Block Snorlax to potentially try to utilize. Yeah. I feel like this one is not very good though. What? You think it's good? Four of these. Really? What happens when you, you just hit a couple a couple goons and they're screwed? Like, how do they deal with that? But what if you hit nothing and you did nothing? Play another one. And then you hit nothing. Then it's got to be in their hand. Eric's invitation. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I think this card makes quad lax like I could be really yeah. good. Okay. So my guess is that some of the decks that are coming out alongside this card are probably pretty good against blocks or lax. That's my guess. Like the Palafin deck, gonna probably have like. You a know, lot of switch cards. Parades, switch yeah. cards. Won't really maybe care about you trapping something. So that's my guess is that there's other decks that are coming out that combat it just fine. So they're not scared of the flute existing. But yeah, this card is like pretty ridiculous in control. Or not control, but like quad block wax. I don't think you'd play this in control. But you play a you play this like a four of them block wax. That's your win condition. You just like, just go. Next up is going to be just a bunch of cards that have to do with this stadium they all interact with each other kind of so you think should i just go through and read them all and then we can talk about each of them or do you want to go one by one well we could just read the festival and then just read diplin okay you don't want to read any of the other guys <laughs> all the other ones attack suck yeah. they all the same ability yeah so it's festival plaza is this new stadium card it says pokemon with any energy attached to them cannot be affected by special conditions and they recover from any special conditions not a particularly powerful thing like could be good in a special condition heavy format right yeah. uh like if hypnotoxic laser or something like that existed right um but then we've got the uh, diplin here with the ability festival fever if festival plaza is in play this pokemon can use its attack twice in a row during your turn yeah and then it's attacked to the way 20 of your opponent or each of your bench pokemon so you can be doing 200 damage for mm -hmm. one grass pretty good combo that with tm devo could be pretty good combo that with tm evolution I don't know about that. No, um, no, no, no. It can only use its attacks. That includes those, though, right? It doesn't include those. Oh, is this, like a, is this worded around yeah, that? Yeah, it's worded around that. You can't mm. use it with the TMs. Wait, what does Cram say? Well, we don't know what the... I guess we do know what the English card says, because the Pokemon Twitter tweeted it out. Oh, really? What does Cram say? Uh, go look at it. All right, let's see. DG. They tweeted this out. They tweeted a lot this weekend, so give me a second to find it. No, I think it can. I don't think it can. I feel like I remember seeing something where someone said it couldn't. Or cards are lost on ignore all energy in this Pokemon's attacks cost. Yeah, and this says, if Festival Grounds is in play, this Pokemon may use an attack it has. Not that it can use. An Ooh, attack okay. that it, it has. has. Okay. Yes. So it doesn't gain? It doesn't gain the TM is there attacks. Can, but what is like another, is there another way to check this? No, right? This I just oh, read it to you. Oh, Jump Love. No, 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 but I'm just saying, like, what else do we know that has similar... That can. Yeah, yeah. So I guess they're trying to stop us from being able to use the TMs, I guess. Yes. Because the big one would have been TM Crisis Punch. Probably. 280, 280. 280, 280. Man, so these things suck. Yeah, well, you've got but... the Thwacky here, which is pretty cool. It's a stage one. Once during your turn, if your active Pokemon has the Festival Fever ability, which multiple Pokemon have, yep. as we'll do when we talk about, uh, you may search your deck for any one card and put it into your hand, then shuffle your deck. So the festival, there could be a festival drum engine. Yeah. You send up the, what's this thing called again? Goldeen or a Swirlix with a emergency board on it. Yep. You use Thwacky two or three times, get any two to three cards you want out of your deck. And they would treat in an attack with whatever your attack. Also, I'm going to say, I don't know that the Goldeen is necessarily terrible. It has the Festival Fever, so if that Festival Stadium is in play, you can attack twice. And for two colorless energy, ten damage, flip a coin. If heads, discard one energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. Like, I don't, could there not, you don't think there's any potential no. there for, like, one attachment, m potentially uh, just energy deny your opponent? Nope. Dot deck? Not on flips, not on flip. Yeah. 
If it discarded an energy just straight up, then me. Well, that would probably be broken, right? That sounds just free, good, discard yeah. two energy every turn. Mm, Not yeah. free, but for one attachment. Close enough. On a basic. Um, but yeah, those were all the big ones. There was a new Iron Bundle, a new Brute Bonnet. None of those seemed incredibly good. Uh, one that is kind of interesting here, though, is this Farfetched. It's got this ability, Ad Hoc Wielder. I have no idea if that's how it'll be translated into English what when it comes out. I don't know. <laughs> Once during your turn, when you play this card from your hand onto your bench, you may search your deck for a Pokemon tool and attach it to this Pokemon, then shuffle your deck. Um, and its attack is Mock Cut 30, discard a special energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. So not like a useless attack, and it is colorless. Uh, but the cool thing about this card is that it can go get one of the evolution or devolution tools right yeah. so you can put it into play right away go get tm evolution if you can get it into the active spot use the tm evolution to go get a couple guys in play i think that's kind of cool right yeah the problem is just that it has to come from hand yes you can't nest ball for it you can't poffin for it, it has to be an ultra ball but it would increase your consistency of finding tm evo without playing luminian or arvin right? really yeah. like it could let you play an aggressive supporter as yeah. opposed to arvin right? and then ultra ball for it get into play from there so yeah, I mean, get, yeah. get in and play Jet Energy, something like that, right? Yeah, so it definitely has some potential alongside the uh, Team Evo, Team Devo. Mostly Team Evo. Like, that's what it's, like, basically yeah, going for, is yeah. Team Evo. But, yeah, unless we come up, unless they come up with some way to like, to, like, move tools around, but... Right, sure. Yeah. But it, it does seem, like, a pretty limited, to be honest. Like, its potential is pretty limited. But it would be in some kind of Team Evo deck, I think, more so than anything. And yeah, I think that is it for the new cards. Um, oh, the only other thing to mention would be like the Rillaboom, I guess, that the Thwacky evolves into. Yeah, um, so Rillaboom here. It uh, has the attack Drum Attack, 60 damage for Aggress. During your opponent's next turn, the defending Pokemon's attacks and retreat costs are one colorless more. Which isn't terrible. Nope. But... And then Wood Hammer, two Grass, 180 damage, 50 to itself. That does KO Charizard. It does. It does do that. So... Might be in the Thwacky Engine deck. One Rillaboom, one... Goldeen uh, Control, just wait for it. <laughs> like, like, Goldeen. You mean, mean Goldeen Control? <laughs> <laughs> Although, this party energy gets charged is pretty good. So you start out by Goldeen Controlling them, and then if it gets to a bad spot... Also, you can use... Out with Neo Upper Energy. You can use multiple Thwacky in a turn, right? Yeah, yeah. A Control deck, where you're dis attempting to discard two cards every turn, and then like searching your deck for two to three cards every turn, and just putting them right into your hand based on whatever the situation is... Maybe, yeah. That's not terrible, right? It's maybe potentially less vulnerable than setting up your Pidgeot. Yeah. Right now, Pidgeot's pretty safe on the bench unless you're up against, like, Tina, but... It's a little easier to set up than a Pidgeot, maybe. Yeah, yeah. A few stage true. ones, yeah. Chain them together, right? I could see it. Just the thwacky. That's a new control. Golding engine. control, baby. Golding Come control. on, here we go. <laughs> there it is. Look out. But yeah, those are all the new cards that have come out. Um, there is, the morning that this episode is going to be released, there is going to be some new stadium card revealed. We don't know exactly is what it, like it is. Is it confirmed a reprint or no? No, it's, it's confirmed not different. reprint. It's confirmed a new card. But, oh, but in, in the uh, post um, <laughs> that they did for it, oops, hang on. They put in the thumbnail <laughs> Mew, VMAX, and Path to the Peak. Of course. So, who knows? Maybe it's just like a card that says, if your opponent's active with a Mew, VMAX, it gets KO'd. That's why they have Mew, VMAX there. It was like the extra tech, it was the extra Mew tech they never released. It is interesting that these are the two cards in the thumbnail. So, I mean, it's probably not a Path to the Peak reprint, right? I mean, something similar to Path to the Peak seems pretty good with Palafin. Like, imagine Path to the yeah. Peak existing, its ability doesn't happen, and then you just evolve it. It's just a stage one. You don't have to worry about switching or anything like that. Yeah. That would, that would be it's already good. broken enough, you know? Yeah. It happens in, what, from right now. Six and a half hours, we'll know what the stadium is. Yeah, we are recording a little late. Uh, normal time for me, late for Azul. All right, let's get into the next segment of our podcast. But before we do, we do have to take a moment to thank our incredible sponsor, Dragon Shield, for supporting us here at the Uncommon Energy Podcast. Of course, you guys know them, Dragon Shield. They make the best card gaming and tabletop gaming products and accessories on the market. We love them and use them mostly for their card sleeves, but they also make some great binders, deck boxes, so much more. 
I love the Magic Carpet XL that I use to transport my cube. I use the cube shells as well with my, my cube. Um, Azul, Rock of the Dragon Shields this weekend. What uh, color did you go with? Went with the Tangerines Day 1, Auroras Day 2. All my extra Auroras that I bought for Orlando got poached from my roommates. Oh, no. <laughs> no, everyone else was slacking on the sleeves. Yeah, I know. So I had to come through, hook them up with some Dragon Shields. Um, Do you need some but... sleeves for Orlando now? Yeah. Did you bring enough? I did not, so... Okay, I've got some sleeves for you. I'm sure the, the vendors always are stocked with Dragon Shields, though, so... Yeah, yeah. I'll have my, my roommates uh, buy me some Dragon Shields back. There the you event. go. That's what you, yeah, that's what you gotta do. But yeah, worked great as always. No complaints. And uh, yeah. Yeah, always loving the Dragon Shields. Always get the job done. Check them out. So great that even your roommates want to poach your know, boxes right? of cards or boxes of sleeves, right? Yeah, I need them to make them just like slightly worse so that doesn't happen. I just need like. <laughs> <laughs> so you're guaranteed to hold on. To them I know, more. right? Yeah, that's all I need. Um, but yeah, shout out to Dragon Shields always. Love having them. Sponsor our podcast. Love working with them. Check them out. Dragonshield.com. You can use the code UEPOD to get yourself 5% off and support directly here on the podcast. Yep. Over next, we've got Guess That Flavor Text. This week, it is my turn to read a flavor text of a card, and then Chip will try and guess what Pokemon that card belongs to. No peeking. And i got to find my phone, because I had it on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if Chip can guess correctly without using a single lifeline, Chip will get uh, four points for each lifeline Chip chooses to use. Uh, we'll get one less point. Uh, the lifelines are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and then read an attack name. Chip, are you ready? Yeah, last week, Azul, you caught up big time yep. with a three-point spike. Well done. Congratulations. Oh, uh, so the score is now currently 20, excuse me, 21 for myself, 15 for Azul. We'll see if I can pick up some more of those points and continue to widen the gap. All right, here we go, Chip. Despite what its appearance, su appearance suggests, it cares for others. If it's if it finds vulnerable weak Pokemon, it pro pro protectively brings them into its water bubble. Uh, it's either Dewfighter or Araquanid. I think I think it's Araquanid. Let me go with um, what stage the card is. It is a stage one. All right, Araquanid, lock it in, it slam dunk. <laughs> Let's oh, go. Oh my. Gosh. Easy buckets, Shit. baby. Was it just the end there? Uh, its ability in the video game is called Water Bubble. Well, that is unfortunate. And also, that's the name of the ability on the <laughs> card that was good. I did not pick that one for the flavor. Which text. one? Uh, which uh, one is it? Um, bottom left. Well, my my lead was very quickly. And I didn't make the same mistake I made when I knew it was either Whiskash or Barboach. Yeah, but what'd you end up guessing in the end? Did you I guessed guess Whiskash, that? and it was, it was Barboach. Barboach yeah. yeah, so well, I used the, the lifeline. Respect the stage, yes. Yeah. Araquanid with its water Man. bubble on its face. Yeah, look. Uh, two, there were two, Remember this? There was like yeah. the Sun and Moon base set one, and then the Grass one. Uh people use it to beat fire decks to beat volcanian right yeah and it was like a reprint of the same card and it was literally the the ability name was water bubble dude my goodness this is the point humbling over here i gotta remake up my lead next week i guess yeah good luck with that all right well orlando's coming up this weekend orlando and perth which means we might adjust our predictions a little bit actually we can probably keep some of them the same um yeah orlando <clears throat> And Perth Regionals this weekend. Yep. Orlando going to be... Actually, it might not be the biggest regional, the biggest major tournament outside of Japan. Perth definitely won't be. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Indy might be. It's close right now here. I'm going to pull up the numbers. Um, yeah, Indy's still over a month away, right? So it's got time. Oh, maybe not over. I guess right around a month away. I don't even remember when it is. <laughs> it's Every, all up. tournaments blur together. Currently... They're very close. For Orlando, it's two eight eight seven, and for Indianapolis, it's two eight seven eight. What's uh, LA looking like? Two thousand for LA. Yeah, I think LA might be capped as well. I'm actually not sure. Okay. Actually, can you can you check if you can register for Indy right now? For Indy, yeah, I'll check. I know there's still spots in Orlando. There's a decent amount of spots still left for Orlando. So if you're thinking about going or wanting to go, you can still register for Orlando Regional Championships yep. in all divisions in all games. I think. It's pretty cool. Um, Indianapolis, I'm not sure. And this is like, 
Well, I mean, we talked before with the registration stuff about like how it's like a good thing that the tournaments are capping, but I think it's also a good thing to see that here at the end of the season, tournaments are getting bigger and not capping. So they're like adjusting for this aggressive growth. So I think that's cool to see. And I do think like in a perfect world, you don't you, like you want there to be like a couple weeks before the event and someone who's local can find out about it and still go to it, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be like ideal. But still getting close to the cap. We still want to be sure. getting close. Yeah, we want to keep growing. Um, we want but I guess if we don't then maybe just adjust around them. The caps are smaller next year, which is going to try to register for Indy, right? Yeah. Cuz there's still I know there's room for Florida. They yeah. tweeted about it earlier today, so Indy um, space. So is that available? Yeah. That's available. Uh, or do I have to click through to register? No, it should be available then. Yeah. Okay. So you can still register for Indy as well. There you go. Because I saw someone post on Twitter about not being able to register for Indy, but they might have been. It's possible they're a video game player. Maybe you can't register for the video game side of things. Yeah. But yeah. If you're a TCG master, can still register for Orlando and Indy, and maybe LA. Um, and stock. I think Stockholm still has opens as well. Openings as well. So yeah. Lots of tournaments still coming up. Lots of opportunities for people to try to chase and get those last few points they maybe need to lock up the invites, right? Yeah. Um, Stockholm's another one. If you're an American and you're like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. To, maybe you're like an East Coast American and you're like, mm, LA Regionals is kind of expensive. It actually might be cheaper to go to Stockholm. Yeah, because my flight to Stockholm it was like 500 out of Chicago. Yeah. So if you're on the East Coast, you can probably find something better than that. I'll potentially find something better than that. So it'll be something worth looking at. Uh, yeah, especially if spots are available. But yeah, let's talk about the tournaments this weekend. Let's talk about the meta. So I was actually thinking about this earlier. Not th not thinking as much about Perth, but like for Orlando, there's 2,800 uh, players, right? What number of players do you think were also at EUIC? Like what's the crossover percentage there? Uh. 500? For all divisions? Just like TCG players in general? Let's just think TCG Masters. So Because then we're looking at 24 or something. Um, I don't 500, know. 1,000? No, Probably not 1,000. No, that's way too hard. There's so many European locals who just have no plans. Come. But they tweeted that there was people from 31 countries yeah. in attendance at Orlando. I mean, I know you're going to have people like, um, probably like, I'm not sure about Gustavo, but William Azevedo is going to be there. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine a lot of people that traveled from outside of Europe, like any yeah, Latin yeah, American yeah. player, maybe, uh, you know, Australia. Well, probably not Australians because they would go back they to... They have their own, yeah. Yeah, they'd go back to I mean, to we say own. that, but there's Americans going to Australia when there's... That's true. Regions ...with open spots. That so. is true. Some people are. <laughs> Making that actually maybe league. any of the Japanese players. I think they, but Australia's got to be so much closer for them, right? Yeah, but maybe make a little vacation out of well, it. Well, maybe they just know. go from Europe to Orlando. Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, right? okay, that's, okay, that's okay. what people would be doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I don't expect any person who lives in Brazil to have to go home to go, go back home. home and and then go back. It's pretty reasonable for them. Maybe it won't even be that bad. Maybe not. Yeah. Especially now that they just heard that there's spots open. Maybe they're just like, all right, maybe <laughs> go um, check it out. I don't know. A lot of Americans that travel to EUIC are probably going to Orlando as well. Yeah, that would so, be the thing as well as how many Americans were at EUIC. Yeah, where would you find that Pokedata? Yeah, I'm going to go look. What was the number? 369. Hmm, okay. 369. So maybe around like 300 players that were at EUIC or EUIC are also going to be at Orlando. No, yeah. maybe around 400. Because the Canadians, too, there were 78 Canadians. Yeah, 78 Canadians, yeah. Maybe around 400. Yeah, yeah, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, it's still pretty high. It still seems high, though. Maybe... Yeah. But the majority of people who are there were not people who were at EUIC, right? Majority of people who were at Orlando. At Orlando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They won't be people who Yeah, they will not be people who are, went to EUIC as well. So, like, the majority of people... Two to three hundred. ...are going to be people who are... Um, well, I w yeah, I mean, I would expect if there's 396 Americans at EUIC, I would say probably 300 plus of them will be at Orlando. Like, if they're making the EUIC trip, you know? Yeah. And for Canadians, it's probably like, if there's 78, there's probably 50 of them that are going to Orlando, right? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, you might be right. It's probably... It's it probably, might be close to 500. I don't know. I just don't know. The, I mean, more people anyway, are trying to go to EUIC than Orlando, though. So sure. I think if you're going to skip something, you're skipping Orlando, not UIC. Right. Regardless, though, regardless, um, 
A lot of players. Yeah, a lot of players. A lot of people's first time playing the format, right? Yep. Uh, for those people, it's their first tournament of the format. Uh, maybe they played in some locals last weekend, right? Yeah. Or Cups Challenge, whatever. Yeah, online tournaments. But their first, like, you know, big major tournament of the format. Um, what impact do you expect the results of EUIC to have on their decision making when it comes to what deck they play? Um, we'll talk about it a little bit. Many people are already locked up, or will they change some techs based on the results, or changing lists entirely, or maybe they didn't know what deck they were playing? I don't know. It's tough because, like, from LAIC, it seemed like LAIC influenced the meta a lot, right? Because mm -hmm. it literally was a uh, ride on wins from being like a five percent deck, if I'm remembering correctly, six percent deck. I feel like is what it was at in wins, and at fifteen percent of the meta, which is like a huge leap. Um. I don't know, it's just a, it's I don't know how much it's gonna be the meta's gonna be influenced this time by that though. Um, or if maybe people are gonna be a little bit more set in their their deck choice. But like after you see like all these Charizards with Eerie, do you really wanna bring Chi and Pao? Um or you see like I don't know, I guess there wasn't like that many texts for Lugia, was there? No. I mean there was the Sinnohs and the Tinas, but but maybe you see how good hands did and you're like, Do I really wanna play Lugia? Um What are you pointing at? On Poke data for some reason in the picture of like what Pokemon are featured in the deck. There's an Espathra next to Fabian's name. Oh. And a Banette. <laughs> no. Decks like what? Yeah. Fabian, um, depending on what he's up against, switching decks. What the hell? Oh, snap. This guy, bro. <laughs> Azul's calling what the out. Heck? What do you know, Azul, that we don't know? I don't know. He conveniently had a cleft key when he played against me. So Whoa. Like, oh. Oh. <laughs> Was that tough, buddy? It was annoying. He started in game one. Oh, it's definitely tough. annoying. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. It's really hard to tell. Like I said, yeah, LA, we look at LAIC as an example. And LAIC influenced the meta a lot. Yeah. Because a lot of people have written off Maridon, like I said many times already. It wasn't a super popular deck. And then it wins. And then the next week, I believe there's a European tournament, and it was 15% of the meta. The most popular deck over Charizard. <sighs> Did pretty poorly, I think, if I remember correctly as well. But... Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, are we going to see that same kind of... I mean, Charizards can't go any higher, but I think we'll see Tina spike. Will we see stuff like Lugia drop off, though? Because it's like, well, there's two hands in top eight. Do I really want me running into Lugia if hands is going to come up like that? Probably not. That matchup's, like, terrible. Um, all the Most of the Charizards had Eerie. Did William play Eerie? William had Eerie as well, William right? had Eerie. Do I really want to play Chi and Pound to every Charizard having Eerie? But does everyone just copy Tord and not have Eerie? Right. But does everyone copy Tord except for the control text, and now they have Yuri? Yeah. Right, because I think that'd be That's like... That's what it, you would add, yeah. I think if people are looking at Tord's list, the number one thing they're cutting is the double Turo. Yeah, sure. Just be like, oh, screw it. I'm going to take the other control, whatever. Uh, and then you'd probably play Yuri, right? Because you want to show up some other matchups. If you're taking a harder control matchup, you want to show up some other matchups in place of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to say that it's going to have a huge impact on the meta, just like LAIC did, to have kind of, like, consistency. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It's, like, it's hard to predict if it... Because that was like a huge shift, I feel like, from LAIC to... Um, from LAIC to the following uh, major tournament after that. Um, I'm trying to like find the LAIC numbers. That's Peoria. How far do we have to go? Don't the regional... The IC ones look different? There you different? go. Yeah, that's it. It was 8%. So it wasn't too far down. Yeah. Um, so it was 8% of the meta. At LAIC. At LAIC. But then it won. Juho won with it. And then it spiked up to 15%. But if Juho doesn't win, it never next... spikes, right? Um, Make sure we're remembering correctly. 16%. Yeah, 16%. Even higher. And yeah, Guardian was number, the number two deck at 12. Zara quite hadn't quite caught steam yet. It was only at 11. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's like a... It's an interesting when we have that as an example. It's like, does, are we going to see a following trend? Um, I think Charizard probably comes down. Right, twenty. It never it twenty. Maybe comes out to like nineteen, eighteen. But also like twenty-three percent is a lot. Yeah, but so many people. Like, but also, if, why if, why play anything besides Charizard? If they've been testing Charizard for oh yeah, no one's putting down Charizard. Yeah, if they've been testing it and then it just won, like <laughs> yeah, we're not. No one's gonna put down yeah. Charizard. There's no reason to. Also, Tord will be at the tournament. I'm pretty sure, and uh, I expect he will probably play Charizard again too. Right. Yeah, I can't imagine he's dropping Charizard. But, yeah. Probably switch up the text. He might switch up the Yelchi or stuff, right? Yeah, that'd probably be the... the I also could see him just rolling the same 60, honestly. Yeah. I mean, can't really complain. I mean, Control yeah. is still really good. I think Control will... 
have another pretty successful tournament. I think yeah, I mean, be, two uh, control in top eight, right? Yeah, and we could have seen... Fi- we didn't even finish going through our... Uh, uh, oh. our prediction recap because one of our other predictions. No, we did. Oh, we did. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. Okay, I was thinking of our last episode. I think. Yeah, two control top eight. Yep, yep. And Alessandro could have gone further for sure, right? Like, um. Yeah, if Alessandro ultra balls away his four seal stone, you know, like, mm-hmm. who knows? Bradner was pretty screwed, I think, in that game one. Yeah. So there was definitely some more potential for to have gone further. And the control deck is definitely a deck that can like isn't as screwed over by the time rules as like quad lax. Right, that's true. So too. I don't know, maybe you just keep the double turo yell cheer um, to be able to beat the. Although that those those cards in general are like, well, I mean they're pretty good against control. Even if you're not getting back yell cheer yeah. or not yell cheer, even if you're not getting back turo, you can just get back two more boss. Keep bringing up the Pidgeot over and over again or something like that, right? So yeah, you have a so if a you good package if you sit down across from someone and they flip over a Charmander at this tournament, how often are you assuming that they are playing Cleffa Bibrel, Pidgeot, Prime Catcher? Um, All of that stuff is probably pretty low, right? I don't know. The Cleffa probably... They probably have Cleffa now. Yeah. Because it wasn't just Tord. It was William as well. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if there was much other Cleffa besides You can play less two. Nest Ball. That's like the thing, right? Yeah, Tord play played one Nest, Nest Ball. ball. Yeah. William still had three Nest Ball, I believe. I think so. I don't know how many Poffin, though. Maybe it was a 3 3 split? Was it? Yeah, there's three, a 3 3 split. Which is it kind of surprising because of the Clefo. Like, that's assuming it's Max Poffin. At Poffin that point. would be better, yeah. But Rotom is still very good. Yeah, I can't complain. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from Charizard, to be honest. <laughs> there's so much stuff that it could be. Do they have TM Devo? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm going to beat him anyway. Do they have Mist? Do they have TM Devo? Yeah. They probably have Eerie. I would say you should probably play as if they have Eerie, but. Honestly, it's kind of cool, though, right, that uh, there's a lot of different things you could be playing against, right? It's mm-hmm. At some point... Doesn't that almost feel like maybe Charizard's too good, though? If the deck that could is be all these things, and it's not like, oh, well, no, that's just bad. Why would you play that? Mm-hmm. Like, no, that's actually not terrible. Well, it's kind of interesting because, like, I don't know, it almost feels less fun sometimes to play in formats where you have perfect information, you know? Because there's no chance of surprise. Or, I don't know, maybe from a competitor standpoint, do you prefer playing with perfect information? Um, It's interesting. Because I feel like there's a lar- larger scale gap without perfect information. Like, closed deck lists, there's higher ceiling. You can make assumptions on what they play based on the counts of the other things that have been in their deck that you've seen so yeah, far. Yeah, exactly. And they stuff. have so yeah. many things. Once William puts down the second TM Devo, you're not just like... You, at that point, if you haven't seen Mist, I'm not going to play around Mist energy anymore. You yeah. Know? Like, you gotta, something has to get cut out at this point. For sure. So, yeah, I'm not too sure, to be honest, um, what we're playing around. To be real, like, I think Clefuga at the very least, like, Clefuga is just worth playing right now. There's, you know, it gets around stuff like, and also, like, Guardi does get more popular. Then they have the the Clefki, which shuts down your Rotom. I mean, they still have the Fluttermane. Yeah. But now they have to make a call. Do they play around, um, do they put the Klefki in the active to shut down the Rotom? Um, or do they put the... I guess the Fluttermane doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. Yeah, Not in that matchup, yeah. <laughs> so, oh. in the active. I was letting you cook, you know? And you just hit him with the Klefka anyways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to play around with Charizard right now. It makes it hard to play against. So you've already said a couple times you think Giratina is going to increase in popularity. Yeah. Top three decks? Yeah, maybe? I think for sure. You think it's like 8 to 10, 12%? 10%? 10 to 12, yeah. 10 to 12? That'd be a pretty aggressive increase, but, I mean, I guess it would be pretty easy. I mean, Giratina was so popular last format. Yeah. If there's anyone who's up in the air, pretty much everyone has played Giratina in the last format. Yeah. And if they feel like Giratina seems good, y'all's list, Bradner's list, whichever it may be, pretty easy to pick that up, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the biggest thing. Is like A lot of people are like, on. they played Tina before, maybe they played a little bit of Tina in this format. You know, they were rocking their Lugia deck. They see two hands get top cut, but they're like, oh, it seems like Tina's good. Just going to switch over to Tina now just play Tina. Is this what you do whenever we're recording and, you, like, you're at home and, it's like, I'm here? Yeah, but sometimes they catch new updates. I always just look for Pokemon stuff. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. It, as well, just sitting here doom-scrolling Twitter. <laughs> like, caught that there was new cards released that one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just only looking out for Pokemon information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not stopping to look at any of the basketball stuff. Nope, nope. Look at a lot of that. Um, control. Where does control sit going into this one? Pretty strong finish at a UIC, right? Two different variants in top eight. Um, but you got to go down a little ways to find another one, right? It was definitely pretty top heavy. 
there was Samuel Gay with a top 32 finish with a Pidgeot Control build. Uh, Emma out here, 36 with Pidgeot Control. Um, so it does drop off quite a bit from the, the top heaviness, right? Yeah, and also, like, you can, which is, like, kind of a cool thing to see. that The two names that are in the top, Alessandro, like, uh, almost like the con control godfather at this point. Yeah. I feel like Sanders, like, the modern control, uh, whatever, but, like, Alessandro's, like, the control godfather, <laughs> <laughs> like, from, for so long now. Uh, and then Bert, a pretty recognizable name as well. Yeah. Um, maybe not for some of the newer players who are just getting to the game, but definitely a respected name. Yeah, Bert's going around, yep. For sure. Top eight of um, worlds. And it is one of those harder decks to play, right? Even though it's like hard to play against, it is also a deck where like one bad quick search, you could put yourself in a terrible spot all of a sudden. So um, it's going to be a deck that's hard to play, but it has so many options right now, so many different tools. And we look at all the lists, and there's so many different things going on now. There's like cloth, there's wiggly tough, there's like uh, was it Emma had a what was that Pokemon? Uh, the Great Tusk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's up with the cloth? When you attack it, you discard an energy. So again, Charizard, you just put it in the active. And then if they want to attack, they have to lose an energy. Okay. And then you penny it. Okay. And then they run out of energy. <laughs> also, when you, like, gust stuff up, then you should have to move it by retreating. Okay. It's an easy way to remove all of Charizard's energy, I feel like. Is it better than some of the other strategies? I don't know. No clue. Couldn't tell you. But that's, like, the purpose sure. for the most part. I don't know what other matchups it has, like, a strong... Does it work? Uh, if you played against it as Charizard, what do you do? Put five energy on your Radzard? Boss their Pidgeot and punch that instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you still hit, though, they're going to have a tool on it, though. So you get one KO. Mm -hmm. And then... The biggest thing right now is that you can, like, you can like gust, gust Pidgeot multiple turns in a row to KO it. Yeah. Because um, they don't have Cheryl anymore. The Cheryl made things kind of awkward. Um, and no one's, like, playing Turo. Oh, no, this list does have Turo, actually. Actually, do most of the lists have Turo? Let me, like... No one's playing Turo. Wait, do most of the lists have Turo? All right, Alessandro, no Turo. Bert does have the Turo. So there is ways to reset the Pidgeot. Then there's two candy, but... Only two candy. And you could get to a point where it's stabilized enough where you don't care about not having access to Quick Search anymore, I guess. Also, they have to lose the Gust Effect to bring it up, so... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the best way to play it. A lot of different ways to run stuff up. Like, All Out Blitz is someone who's been doing, like, the Cloth and the Wiggly Tough, I think. Yep. In online tournaments, and that's... That's something to look at as well, but yeah, it's just uh, yeah, control's good. At the very least, it's good, and as long as the cards you do you play do something in some matchups, then yeah, if you got like a well, you got something going on, you'll be able to win games. It's gonna be hard for people to play against it. Where do we feel like the Iron Hands Iron Crown deck sits right now? It felt like, I mean, it had a pretty good tournament, right? Like, I mean, two in yep. the top eight. The fourth most popular deck in day one, or fifth most popular deck in day one, right? Yeah, because Artina yeah. was fourth most popular. For some reason. Yeah, we gotta scroll for a while to find an Artina in day two, don't we? Arc Armourouge outplaced it. Arc Armourouge outplaced and it. And Arc uh, Eerie Grabber Luxray outplaced it. I saw that. That's deck. Cool. Yeah, I've tried some like quad Arceus like Grabber deck on TCG Live. It was kind of okay. <laughs> Not that good. Uh, but yeah, um, Iron Hand still seems pretty solid. I don't know if your Charizard matchup is that good. Nope, I don't think so. But you're pretty solid into everything else still. But if the Charizard met decks like over tech, right? If they just like keep adding more yeah. stuff from your are and control. You're pretty good against Tina. I'm clunkier. You're pretty good against Ancient. Hey, your Tina matchup is not great. It's like fine. And then you're pretty good against Gardevoir, I feel like. Yeah, I, I assume you have to have a good Gardevoir matchup. But we're assuming Gardevoir becomes like a relevant matchup to worry about. Yeah. Which it could. But like, you're favorite against Shi and Pao, you're favorite against Lugia, which are like the next two biggest decks from EUIC. Yeah, I don't think Gardevoir is going to be like a top... I think a 5%. I should think at least it, get to 5%. I think, well, I wouldn't be surprised to see it at 6th place on the graphic at like, you know, 7% or something like really? that. Yeah. It'll go that high? It could, I guess it could. It would be a pretty big jump, but... I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to put a hard... Like... That's not going to be, like, my hot take going in is, that, like, Gardevoir yeah. is going to be that popular. Uh, but I, like, wouldn't be that shocked to see that happen, you know? Yeah. I guess I, yeah, I wouldn't be that shocked either, especially if the deck is actually that good. Um, I guess Ancient Box will probably increase in play a little bit more than Gardevoir will because Ancient Box is a little bit more... Or maybe the Roaring Moon deck. Ancient, Ancient Moon. Box was already more popular than Gardevoir, 
yeah. uh, currently in the format. And now it's also another deck that there's like good lists out there. There's the Roaring Moon thing out there as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I guess I could see that. I could see it. Is Chien Pao just going to fall off the face of the earth? I think Lugia might. I don't know about Chien Pao. I think Lugia seems pretty good, man. I think Chien Pao still has his believers. Um, and I think it'll carry on for a little longer. Um, and maybe prove itself or, or it might fall off. But um, it's so crazy we're in the days of like just good hollow rares being 10 cents. It is kind of wild. Looking up Dunce Marshes. Yeah, and uh, at Roaring Moons, I wanted to see how much they were. Well, those are probably worth a decent amount. Three bucks. Three bucks? Try 10 cents. Jeez. What? 25 cents. Never mind. No. Yeah. 25 cents. We're past the days of $5 hollow rares, I guess. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I guess. Yeah, what the heck? That is kind of wild. Yeah, I guess Ancient Box is another one that could... I guess maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't think... Maybe that would be you. more likely to be, like, the sixth deck on the graphic. Right? Or the Warren Moon deck. I can see the Warren Moon deck. Also Does Arctina there. fall off the graphic completely? Hopefully. <laughs> Dude, it's like the Moon of last format. It was like, there's no way... Moon was not good enough to be 15% of the meta last format. That was if crazy. you wanted to play Arceus for this tournament, it's Arceus Armorers, right? Or the Arceus Eerie deck, I guess. I, I can find I... some way to break that. Yeah, I don't know if I consider the Arceus Armorers deck that much better than Arctina, to be honest. I haven't played anything with it, so... Not sure, but maybe Ark is eerie. You can always cheese everyone, right? Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think Lugia seems good. You're hating on Lugia a little I bit. I mean, I think Lugia's fine, but I think it's just fine. The next two inconsistent. Um, I don't think that's so. true. Everyone's saying it's so inconsistent. I don't really feel like that's the case. I, think it's terrible. I don't think it's like like terrible, like some people think, but I think it is. If it's, it was consistent, the deck would be the best deck in the format. The deck would be disgusting. But it, the inconsistencies of it is what like, kind of keeps it in check. Having to rely on Great Ball and Aroma. Yeah, maybe it wouldn't be the best deck in the format, but it'd be pretty, it'd be pretty good. If it'd Evo be Incense better. and Quick Ball still existed. Yep. Maybe, yeah. yeah, if I don't be doing it, yeah. So now we're talking. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're getting days. excited. <laughs> yeah, if it was, yeah, if it was consistent enough, it would be kind of, the deck would be kind of, I mean, not broken, but like, it'd be kind of ridiculous. Like, right now, I think, I think also a lot of lists are pretty, like, bad. They Like, you just need to just play good the cards yeah. that just do your main strategy like not playing uh four Mancino doesn't make any sense not playing maximum great balls i think like playing any kind of cute stuff like the maximum belts or vacuums to try and beat the hand stack like you need to maximize consistency consistency with the deck and even then the deck is like it's like it's a solid deck in the meta but it's i think the one ridiculous. place that i think i guess like the biggest thing there's because of that in mind, there's no room to innovate on the deck. That's yeah. like the problem. It's yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah. this broken Lugia. Like, we did, there was a list that did pretty well May Day 2 with like the Quad Morty. Um, I'm not sure how how good I think that oh, is. Oh, I didn't though. see that. That's cool. Yeah, I'm not sure where it is, but. I'm going to find it. Um, that could be maybe as far as the innovation goes. But it's still just like a different form of like max consistency, right? Where it's not like. Yeah, I don't know. Lugia definitely is sight. It's all right. It's all right. You got a good control matchup. That's good. I'm finding the Morty list. I think it made it too, anyways. Jesse Spencer, top 64 with Quad Morty. That's pretty yeah. cool. With the four Mancino, a 2 2 Lugia line. Did yeah, you see I, that? I talked, to Je- I talked to Jesse about that a little bit, and I was like, What's up? Well, well, yeah, I was like, one of the lines of play that he talked me through was like, Oh, you don't ever care about opening Lugia, you call for family. And then immediately after that, he was like, Oh, and then you just read the win. What do you mean? I was like, I, how do we get the? We have, we'll have two Lugia. How do we get this thing in the active? You have jets. You have jets. You can get there. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that could be it, right? The quad Morty. But as soon as people know, they've only got two Lugia V. Well, no, no, the quad Morty thing. Like, so, I, oh, they just don't put stuff. Yeah, in they play. just don't mention. Yeah, 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 just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and um, even like going to a turn without knowing that you pick up the going, you pick up on that going. But can you still set up enough? I wonder if the question would be if you can still set up enough with them doing that. Well, I'm not that like sacrificing. Hurts their setup enough. Well, I'm not going to like sacrifice a flower selecting for my turn, but if I don't have to bench a Greninja ahead of time because uh, I know I'll get one more card, I don't need the concealed cards, then I won't do that. You know, sure. I'm not going to overly set up. You know, if we if I can, if my hand is going to afford to under set up to play around Morty, knowing they play four, sure. But if that becomes the norm and that becomes the best way to play the deck, who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I think Lugia, Lugia's problem is just consistency. 
and I don't think that I can be built consistently enough to actually make it a consistent top contender. Now, if it gets a couple top eights here, I'm sure it'll get its top eights at some point throughout this format, for sure. Mm -hmm. There was a few decks playing Morty in day two. Uh, Arctina, and then two Goldengo. The Dango. The Dingus. Yeah, so this deck was on the best of the rest graphic in day one. Uh, it was like the 12th most popular deck. <laughs> so pretty low. Yeah. A couple percent meta share. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's definitely down a bit from where it was in the last format, right? You know, it was like a four or five or last yeah. format a little it bit. It built itself up there a little bit. Is this a deck that has any potential? Nope. Okay. Well, Azul, what deck do you want to talk about? <laughs> Every Charizard has Radzard, and then on top of that, some of them have maximum belts. Yeah. They could, the power of Golden Go against the Charizard matchup was they can't, Charizard can't KO anything. Sure. Want to KO anything for but Now they a have maximum turns. belt. Yeah. Now I got maximum belt. They all have Radzard. Pack it. Um, I mean, we kind of talked about most of the relevant decks, I think. The the standout ones that have the potential for the come up Roaring Moon and the Ancient Box. Um, We didn't talk about Lost Box. That's something we could talk about a little bit. That's true. We did have Pedro's Lost Box deck. He got top, top 16. 16. Uh, and this is like, uh, there was a couple other ones like Raz. In day two, was playing something pretty similar, um, but yeah, this is like pretty close to like what most people were playing for Lost Box. Yeah. The Hoopa EX, the Roaring Moon, Raikou, and Iron Hands is their core two prize attackers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Lost Box is interesting. Once once again, another deck I played zero games with. So, um, I it's Lost Box still seems mid just because your Charger matchup seems bad, like unfavorable. So with that in mind, I think yeah, I think Lost Box is still just in the situation where it's still pretty mid overall. Um, I don't think the... Uh, Prime Catcher's an insanely powerful card for the deck. Yeah. That's for sure. Prime Catcher does so much for this deck. Uh, for win condition. Same thing with Lost Team. It kind of lost on decks in general. Uh, Prime Catcher's absurd in it. But you're still working so hard. Um, I, mean, I just don't think your, your Charizard matchup is, is great. I think it's like, I think, yeah, the, the deck overall still feels pretty mid. I mean, I don't think Prime Catcher's enough to kind of like save it from last format. Or last format it still felt kind of similar. I hope when the Evolution series gets to uh, Origins, Temporal Forces. Oh, I hope when we get to Temporal Forces that I pull a Prime Catcher and you pull an Awakening Drum. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty lopsided. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> the Ace Bucks. Give me like a Hero's Cape. No, nah, no shot. All right. You can have Neo Upper Energy if you want. Hey, that could be Crocodile. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, I lost box. I'm still. It still does not feel great to me overall. Um, and it didn't have like a great tournament either, right? It didn't have like a super breakout performance or anything like that. Is Espathra in top thirty-two from Braden? Is this the surprise of the tournament? Surprise of the tournament? No, it's got to be the Moon Dunspar. Still, I feel like a little bit more okay, so. Okay. Either, or or what Bradner brought with the you know. Is there any merit to Moon Espathra? Or not Moon Espathra. I don't think so. Benet Espathra in uh, Orlando this weekend. I don't think so, but I have not played any games with the deck, so once again, I don't have the strongest of a pick. I don't. Does this even have a good Charizard matchup? You have to, right? Braden said he went six one one against it. The one he lost was on stream. Yeah, it is weak to the, the weird thing is that it is weak to Radzard. Yeah, but you and there's a weird interaction there. between its ability and Radzard's ability as yeah. well. Between how many? I wonder if anyone got messed up on that in their game versus Braden. Yeah, thinking they thinking had they could attack and they needed one more energy still. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, they have yeah, yeah. Path of ability increases the active Pokemon's attack cost by a colorless. So even Razzard, Razzard, Razzard yeah, it's like so, they cancel one out, right? Yeah, so basically, Razzard still reduces by the energy as Pathard gives, but it still has one more energy. So if you're at one prize card, Razzard still attacks for one fire. But if you have two prize cards, then you do need the. Uh, wait a second, am I tripping? On four, if you're yeah. at two prize cards, you will left. need two energy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Honestly, I don't even know if it's path that consistently overcomes the rat zone. That still seems tough, right? Yeah. Yeah. Could be. At the end of the game. The, yeah, it has to be at the end of the game, and then maybe are you ahead enough by then that it doesn't matter? Also, like just early game, Bennett can be Charizard decks like the same thing you were talking yeah. about, right? Shout out to Charmeleon. This definitely finds Bennett a lot faster as well. Yeah, than, uh, uh, than Bradner's deck does, right? Yeah, definitely. So that could be a. I mean, if you just get enough early prize cards through that that play, then that can win you the matchup. 
All right, well, let's make some predictions here for the Orlando Regional Championships. We're going to have another two-hour episode here, buddy. Um, That's okay. I don't think anyone's complaining. <laughs> and if you are complaining, stop complaining. I'm complaining. I want to go to bed. <laughs> All right, let's uh, predict a similar prediction to what we did in EUIC. How many Charizard decks will be in the top 32 of this tournament? Are we doing both regionals now? Oh, or yeah. In Orlando? I was thinking mostly just Orlando is mostly what I've been thinking about. Let's just do Orlando because that's where we're both going to be. Okay. It's also the bigger tournament. I don't even know how many people are going to be in Perth. 200, 300? 400, 500? They might be at the... Uh, but they probably oh, no, cap. 500. I don't know if they cap. I'm assuming they did. Let's just... Just Orlando. How many tries are in top 32? All right. Last time I guessed seven. And I was correct. Mm -hmm. But with Cord winning now. True. Does that... I don't know if that was some numbers. See, I don't know if it does. Like, I don't think more people. I don't think more people are gonna play Charizard. They'll probably be playing better lists. Yep. And that. But maybe everyone be playing better lists for other stuff too, right? Maybe. Let's give it a solid. Uh, uh dude. Now, see, I'm like second guessing myself. I don't even know what I want to give it. Let's give it seven again. I'm giving it nine again. We're, just, we're sticking right. with the same numbers. <laughs> I already have my number picked out of my head. All right. How many non-rating zone native competitors will be in Top Cut? So in Orlando, that means someone who's not from the U.S. or Canada, the North American rating yeah. zone. And there's 31 different countries currently registered. Yeah, according to Overload's Twitter. Yeah. So I'm going to go with... Bro, I might get cooked this event. I mean, even one is like... I'm gonna go with two. I don't. I can't say. I can't say too many. So non-U.S. Canadian players, top eighty in Orlando Regional Championships. I'm gonna go with two. Two for Azul. I'm gonna say three. To be honest, You're, we're gonna think we're gonna get cooked that bad. There's just so many people coming. There's yeah. gonna be a lot of people. Yeah, but there's like two thousand Americans. Yeah, but I mean, well, Tord's gonna be there, so there's one. Okay. William, there's two. Gustavo wasn't in EUIC. Maybe he'll be in Orlando. That's three. You know, Pedro, you know, someone. All right. Some Europeans coming over that we probably yeah, don't know Yeah, yeah, Fabian. Fabian was in Vancouver. If he's going to Vancouver, he's probably going to Orlando, right? He said he might go if he did as well at EUIC. If he does well. At EUIC. To try to, like, push for a, a round sure. one by at Worlds. I, I just asked him when I played against him. He said he might come if he does well here. Interesting. I think he's ninth. I, I, I think top 16 would be... You'd probably qualify as good. Yeah, yeah, top 16 out of, you know, 2,600 people. It's pretty good. It's All right, good. last prediction. What a spec will be in the winning deck? Prime catcher. That's a pretty good bet. <laughs> Especially because it does seem like a lot decent amount of Zard players are favoring the prime catcher. Otherwise, maximum bust would have been a pretty good guess if that was kind of the go-to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, based on towards result, right, prime catcher goes up there. I really want to uh, I want to lean into the Roaring Moon to Dunsparce deck, to be honest, but that's Prime Catcher again, so that's boring. <laughs> so we're going to go... Maybe they switch it up and play the drum. Master Ball. So you think Lugia's going to win? Master Ball, baby. And Lugia won't win? Lugia's going to win. You're not going to try to take the, one of those crazy predictions that I do? Nope. All right. Nope. It's just Master Ball and it's Lugia, and that's it. All right. Yeah, come on. That's my call. So if you're thinking about playing Lugia... Play it. <laughs> Please, I need I'm begging you. I need a hand here. <laughs> uh, and with that being said, Azul, I believe that is all we have this week. On the main episode of the podcast, we are going to have our bonus episode. we got a bunch of questions to answer this week. You got anything else you want to say to the people? No, appreciate the support. As always, catch y'all. Nope. Mm -hmm. you got to let me do the socials. and the... We do this oh, every week, you know. Yeah. Nope, yeah. close it after. Thanks so much. To everyone for listening, if you do enjoy, please be sure to leave us a rating, a review, a like, a comment, all those things. Help us out a bunch to help more people discover the podcast. And yeah, supports what we're doing over here with the cast. Uh, and if you want to stay up to date with us, the best place to do it is over on Twitter. You can follow myself at Chip Ritchie, Azul at Azul underscore GG. And you can follow the podcast at Uncommon underscore Energy. Appreciate the support. As always, good luck at Perth or Orlando if you are attending. Catch y'all next week, 7 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday. Peace.